Okay, good. We are now live on YouTube. Good. Good morning, Andrew. Hi. We're, we're matching t shirts, Piers. Oh, yes. Very stylish. Oh, indeed. <laughs> This most styles. In fact, Frank seems to match as well. Maybe, maybe this is the the. Oh no, Frank. Frank's got a pattern on the front of his. That's. Um... I'm gonna dress up because I'm gonna be session chair. So. Okay. Okay, now the numbers are climbing rapidly in more respectable territories. Do you know, Masaki, that your YouTube recording has been watched more than 500 times? Good morning, uh, TV. How are you doing? Amazing. In uh, You can tell that he is in here you because know, we're hearing his. Oops. Just a moment. Okay, I think we're going to start making move with the day's activities. Okay, good morning everyone. Welcome back to the finale of Condensed Matter in All the Cities 2020. Today we have two speakers, Mazaki Oshikawa and Chimiao Si. Uh, let me remind you before I introduce today's speaker of the uh, etiquette, please keep your speakers muted unless you're going to ask a question. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question, you can either type it into the chat or you can raise your hand from the participants uh, channel. Um, although we'd prefer to have a majority of people with their videos off, we like also to have a few people with their videos on uh, because that gives the speaker an impression of the small seminar room. I particularly like to uh, invite students uh, to, uh, uh, to put their videos on a few of you, just so we've got a good cross-section of our audience. Okay, uh, so as you can see from your screen, uh, today uh, Mazaki is uh, uh, on his bicycle in Stockholm. Uh, Mazaki Oshikawa, uh, uh, is a professor at the University of Tokyo at the ISSP uh, in Kashiwa. Uh, and uh, he um, 
Uh, let me tell you a few things about him. Uh, he did his uh, a PhD at the University of Tokyo uh, and later went on to work in the group of Ian Affleck. Um, he has specialized in ideas of topology and particularly the notion that you can learn interesting things from flux insertions. And today he's going to tell us in the second of two wonderful talks about adiabatic versus sudden flux insertion and nonlinear electric conduction. So let us very briefly unmute our uh, speakers and give uh, Dr. Oshikawa a big hand before he starts his lecture. Thank you, Masaki. And now I'm going to hand thank over. You, to hey, uh, thank you. Uh, thanks, Piers, for a nice introduction. And uh, also, of course, for organizing this uh, very interesting meeting. And uh, I also thank or other organizers and the students and uh, yeah, everyone who made effort to make this happen. Okay, so this is a uh, second of my talk, um, some application of flux insertion. And uh, yeah, today I plan to cover a more recent results, which are again simple, but anyway. So something about nonlinear electric conduction. So yeah, okay, so last week, yeah, I could just cover one application, uh, application to fractionalization. But uh, yeah, today, yeah, actually last week, I plan to cover a little bit about the so-called deep shoot matrix theorem, but uh, I ran out of time. So I will try to cover it very quickly today and then uh, uh, discuss a more recent result on nonlinear electric conduction. So just to recap, so I was just using very simple uh, process. So you impose periodic bound condition, then system becomes torus or ring or something. Then there's a hole and uh, you can imagine inserting magnetic flux to this hole, then uh, increase this flux adiabatically so this is so-called Aharonov bone flux, which uh, does not touch the particles which are living on this torus directly. So in classical mechanic, mechanical sense, the, this magnetic field shouldn't have any effect on the particle motion. But in quantum mechanics, uh, because of the Aharonov bone effect, the particles are affected by this flux. Um, so then we increase this flux from zero to two pi or a unit flux quantum. Um, so once the magnetic field reaches the unit flux quantum or two pi, actually in static sense, uh, this flux has no effect again on motion of particles because the order phase difference caused by Harnoff-Bohm effect becomes two pi times integer, which is equivalent to zero. Uh, but Hamiltonian is still different because of the uh, vector potential. So what you can do is that you can apply this large gauge transformation, then you can eliminate uh, this vector potential from the Hamiltonian, then you go back to the original Hamiltonian with zero flux. But in this process, you do adiabatic evolution and then large gauge transformation, then the final state may or may not be equal to the original uh, initial state. So that was the point. So today I want to briefly cover the application to uh, systems on periodic lattice. So this can be applied to more complicated lattice or 3D, but uh, for simplicity, let's consider uh, square lattice. Masaki, uh, well, yeah. your first page. Yeah. Okay, good, just checking. Mm -hmm. Sorry, so. Can I? Go, please go ahead. It's just that yeah. we're only in the picture of Stockholm at the moment, if that's your oh, okay. That's fine. Okay. Um, so we apply the uh, this flux insertion to uh, particles on 
square lattice for C plus C. And uh, let's say the square lattice has size Lx times Ly. And uh, I assume that uh, this many body system has a ground, well, many body system always has a ground state, but I assume that uh, the system is gapped. That is, uh, there is a non-zero separation between the ground state and the continuum of excited states. But uh, this ground state may be degenerate, as we will see. And then I apply this insertion of adiabatic insertion uh, of Mazaki. Yeah. Mazaki, are you do you intend just to show us a picture of Stockholm or, or are okay. you going to show us the next slide? No, this is my only picture of Stockholm. Uh, sorry. No, but will you be showing moving to the next slide? We are worried that it's stuck. Oh, 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 sorry. Sorry, sorry. I, I didn't realize. On, on my screen it's moving. No, so we are, every... no, we are only seeing Stockholm, which is a very nice picture, but that's the only... Oh, okay. Sorry, sorry. I didn't realize. Um, okay, apparently there is some problem. So maybe I will leave the session, then uh, be joined. So, okay, very good. Yeah. Sorry, I... A small station break. So do you see the... We see the first slide. We just see Stockholm at the moment. Okay. Okay. So I changed the page. So you still, you are still seeing the Stockholm? Yes. Hmm, strange. Um, what's going on? Um, so That's, still the same? Uh, no, now we see Arno Flux in oh, Okay. Uh, somehow, when I, you know, uh, make this full screen on my site, yes. Uh, so, are you seeing the adiabatic flux insertion now? Yes, we are. And uh, now I have square lattice. Do you see the square lattice? Unfortunately, no. not. No. Okay. So maybe full screen. Hmm. What's going on? Well, maybe just this... do it like this. This will be all right. Okay. 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 Yeah, then. Okay. Okay, yeah. so you, you can see the page, adiabatic flux insertion. I haven't uh, seen the, the page before that though, yet. Yes, okay, if you start okay. there, yes. Okay, sorry about that. Yeah, I, I didn't get it because uh, apparently there was no problem on my side. Um, okay, so, well, but uh, this was just recap of last week. So uh, I do adiabat adiabatic flux insertion, then generally the ground state evolves to some other state. Uh, uh, but uh, we are in the different case. So in order to go back to the original Hamiltonian, you need to apply this uh, large gauge transformation. Then I want to apply this uh, argument to the many particle on periodic lattice like a square lattice, and let's say the size of this system is Lx times Ly. And uh, then I insert this flux adiabatically, unit flux quantum. So when the system has a periodicity, uh, that means that uh, in other words, uh, we have lattice translation symmetry in this system. So when we have symmetry in the system, then we have some conserved quantity. And uh, so if we have translation invariance, then momentum conservation follows. And uh, maybe it's easier to think about this in continuous space. If you have uh, uh, continuous translation invariance, then momentum is conserved. And the momentum is given by minus i times derivative. But in the lattice, we have only discrete 
translation symmetry. So if Tx is a operator translating by one unit cell or uh, that is constant, the momentum P can be defined in this way. Exponential of IP is equal to the translation uh, symmetry. So then now I do the adiabatic flux insertion, but uh, I can choose a gauge which is uniform, that is order uh, x, which is defined on each link, is uh, given by this proportion of the time. So when t reaches capital T, then you insert unit flux quantum. But uh, in this gauge, uh, the Hamiltonian is always translation invariant. Um, so momentum is exactly conserved. So if the initial state has momentum px0, then even after the adiabatic flux insertion, the momentum is still the exactly the same number. So which is a bit confusing, but uh, we have to be careful that the momentum can mean different things. So in the previous slide, what I introduced is basically a canonical momentum, so to speak. But uh, often uh, we consider kinetic momentum that is minus i times derivative minus vector potential. And uh, this corresponds to the parallel transport if you attended uh, last week. Um, so this is covariant derivative. So this is gauge invariant. On the other hand, this canonical momentum is not uh, gauge invariant. So if you apply large gauge transformation, the canonical momentum changes. But uh, often it's convenient also to use canonical momentum because uh, uh, in order to use the translation invariance, uh, this canonical momentum is more uh, useful. So, so what we do is I start from initial ground state and uh, insert unit flux quantum adiabatically then I assume that the, the gap doesn't close during the flux insertion. So ground state must uh, end up with uh, ground state. But uh, this final state is generally can be different from the ground state. But as I just mentioned, the momentum is exactly conserved. So the final state after the uh, flux insertion must have the same momentum eigenvalue, Px0. But uh, as I noticed, uh, several times. So after flux insertion, we are in the different gauge. Hamiltonian is H with two pi flux, which is different from this Hamiltonian. So you cannot directly compare these two momentum because you are in the different gauge. So you now do the large gauge transformation uh, to this final state. Then you obtain another state. So this must be a ground state of original Hamiltonian. But uh, now, because of this uh, large gauge transformation, the momentum eigenvalue of this state is different, it can be different from the original. And uh, that can be easily computed using this commutation relation between uh, uh, large gauge transformation and the translation operator, because uh, uh, large gauge transformation is given by this, the x coordinate times uh, particle number operator. So if you have u inverse u, they cancel. But uh, if you put the translation operator in the middle, then you shift all the coordinates by one. So this x is shifted to x plus one, then which does not cancel exactly with this. So you have some extra factor, which is exponential of two pi i over Lx times uh, summation of nr. But uh, this is sum of uh, particle number. So which is total number of particle, which is conserved quantity. So if you use this, then uh, uh, momentum of the final state after the large gauge transformation is shifted from the original value by this quantity. Um, so we get this momentum shift, and uh, this is a total number of particles, which is conserved. Um, then we are usually interested not in specific system size like uh, 32 by 33, uh, but we are usually interested in a sound line limit uh, for a fixed particle density that is 
this particle number by, by unit zero. In this case of square root, it's particle number by site. So it's new to be a particle number by site. Then suppose this particle number by site density is P over Q. P and Q are integers, co primes. Um, then this momentum shift is two pi over Lx times uh, a number of sites, Lx times Ly times density. So Lx cancels, but Ly survives. So the momentum shift is two pi times Ly times P over Q. So that means that if you choose this Ly system size to be co prime, so no common factor with Q, then this is still non-trivial uh, fraction number, not integer. And the momentum is mo defined modular integer, but uh, this is fractional number. So that means that uh, after doing uh, adiabatic insertion of unit flux quantum and large gauge transformation, then final state must have different momentum from the initial state. So if the final state is also ground state, then this ground state must be different from the original initial ground state. So that means that uh, you must have uh, ground state degeneracy. So from this argument, so we have some very general constraint on the spectrum of uh, many body Hamiltonian on periodic gratis. That is, uh, so I just assume periodicity or translation invariance and uh, particle number conservation. Then you can define the uh, filling fraction that is number of particle per unit cell. And if this is fractional, then uh, there are two possibilities. Uh, either the system is gapless, or if the system is gapped, then the system must have a Q-fold degenerate ground state. So what is excluded is that uh, you cannot have a, a unique ground state with gap if the particle number density is fractional. So this is, uh, in some sense, uh, shows the uh, ingapability of the system. And uh, this is this kind of theorem is called lipschitz matisse theorem, or generalization of it. So, okay, so probably many people are familiar with this, so I, probably I shouldn't spend too much time on this, but uh, this has a long history. So originally it was uh, just a small theorem for spin one half chain, but uh, uh, gradually extended the uh, uh, range of applications. And uh, now there is more rigorous proof. So you don't really need flux insertion argument because there are now more rigorous proof. But uh, uh, I think it's still kind of uh, intuitive. So it's useful in extending more, uh, more finding more applications. Uh, uh, yeah, there is a yeah, question. Yeah, for finite L, the levels are discrete and there is always a gap formula. Yeah, so, okay, so it's tricky stuff. So yeah, this argument is never really mathematically rigorous, but uh, what I mean is that uh, uh, by gap press, I mean, uh, of course, if you fix the system size L, then generically there is always some gap, but uh, this gap can be order of, let's say, order of one over L or one over L square or something. So which can go to zero as you go to larger system size, some of that limit. So what I'm saying as gap in this context is uh, there is some lower bound of the excitation gap. And uh, for any large system size error, the gap is bigger than this lower bound, then we can call this lower bound as gap. That's how I distinguish. Okay. So, so, so probably many of you are already familiar with this, but uh, as I also mentioned uh, last week, so this kind of argument depends on the crucial assumption that uh, this gap does not close by insertion of the flux. So my argument is something like this. So first I assume the existence of gap. That's fine because otherwise I have gapless excitation. So that's part of the theorem. So it's okay to assume this gap. Then I insert a flux adiabatically. Then after insertion of unit flux quantum, the spectrum must be the same as zero flux. That's 
uh, exact by gauge invariance. Uh, but in principle, you know, uh, somewhere in the middle, the gap may close, or some states might come off from uh, excited states continuum, and uh, maybe you can have a crossing between the excited state and the ground state. Then you switch between ground state and excited state. So if that happens, then uh, you start from this initial state, which is a ground state, and uh, you do the adiabatic flux insertion. And then in principle, you might end up with somewhere in the excitation continuum. If this happens, then I cannot claim uh, the theorems like uh, what I claimed. Uh, a There's a question yeah. here from yeah. Hung Kim. She asks, uh, how does it work in the non-somorphic case? Could you give a brief comment? Okay, yeah, sorry. Um, so in case of non-symorphic case, uh, so, so if you define the uh, unit cell, so unit cell is usually defined with respect to the translation invariance only. So, so um, the unit cell might be big, but uh, non symorphic symmetry means that uh, if you do half translation, then deflection, then the uh, lattice is invariant. And uh, yeah, actually, I kind of forget, but uh, uh, you can utilize this non symorphic symmetry um, by how did it work? Um, okay, so sorry, I forgot, but uh, there, there are some clever way of uh, using this non symorphic symmetry half translation, diffraction, and um, um, you can use this symmetry instead of the the, the standard uh, translation symmetry that it is. So sorry, I, I will try to recall. Yeah. Pro probably it's like you're, yeah. you're allowed to do a lattice operation mm -hmm. and the translation at the same time mm -hmm. as your as your modified translation. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, there is another question. During adiabatic flux insertion, when the ground state goes to an excited state, then one of the excited states must come down to the ground state. Yeah, 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 right, right, exactly, yes. So yeah, if this kind of uh, evolution happens, that means that uh, some other state must come down from the excitation continuum and uh, become the ground state. And uh, there is a crossing somewhere because the uh, number of states must be conserved, yes. But uh, you know, in, in principle, it, that can happen. So from now on, uh, I want to show you uh, that uh, this kind of stuff can happen, but uh, it has some consequence. That's what I want to show. So then that's related to the distinction between uh, insulator and conductor. And um, so the conduction property of uh, the uh, electric conduction property of the system can be characterized by, of course, by conductivity. So the current as a function of uh, frequency and wave number is proportional to the applied electric field. And uh, there is some coefficient which uh, represents the linear response of the system to the applied uh, electric field. So this conductivity is, of course, important quantity you can measure in the experiment and so on and so on. And uh, in particular, here I'm interested in the uh, Q equals zero component of the conductivity. And uh, so this is a function of frequency omega. Then if you look at textbook uh, something, then uh, uh, you can find the expression like this. So this sigma omega can be decomposed to uh, one over omega pole plus some regular function of omega. So this uh, singularity uh, has some coefficient, generally speaking. And uh, this coefficient uh, is called through the weight. So of course, in, you may not have this pole. That means that in that case, this through the weight is just zero. 
And actually, this drew the weight is an um, important quantity with, with which you can distinguish insulator and conductor. And that was uh, already discussed in famous paper by Walter Kohn in 1960s. Um, so basically, this uh, part represents some free conduction of uh, current by electric field. So if D is non-zero, then this means a conductor, or uh, it actually represents uh, some kind of uh, perfect or ideal conductor. So in DR system, there are some relaxation. So this delta would become finite. In that case, you have broadened peak. Um, but uh, if you study conductivity as a function of omega in ideal lattice model with perfect translation symmetry, then often you can find uh, uh, delta equals to infinitesimal. So in that case, uh, if you take a real part of sigma, then you find a delta function peak. And uh, yeah, this delta function peak in real part of the conductivity shows that uh, the system is really ideal perfect conductor. So this is uh, what you can usually find in textbook. But uh, well, this maybe also, I don't know, common sense, but uh, for me, uh, this real time formulation of conductivity and uh, through the weight is more intuitive. So instead of going to, uh, well, you can always do Fourier transform and go to frequency space, but uh, you can also write the uh, conductivity as a function of time. That is uh, current density, you measure time t. So within linear response theory is, uh, you know, the response to the linear response to the applied electric field. But uh, this uh, response can happen with some time DA. So current density at time T can be affected by electric field at time T prime, as long as T prime is uh, less than T because of the causality. So you uh, have this uh, in, uh, convolution kernel and uh, this uh, sigma of T represents uh, uh, current response to the electric field with a given time delay. And of course, if you fully transform this sigma of t, then you get the usual sigma as a function of omega. But uh, you can understand that through the weight in terms of this real time formulation. That is, uh, so if you consider a system with relaxation and so on, uh, if you consider sigma t as a function of time and uh, send t to infinity, that represents the current response to the electric field, which was applied long, long time ago. But uh, if you are, your system has some relaxation, then after a long, long time, the system you know, forgets about the uh, applied electric field. So usually sigma t goes to zero as you send t to infinity. But in perfect conductor, once you apply electric field, you create some current, and this current is uh, perpetual. It's uh, flowing indefinitely. So sometimes sigma t limit for uh, t goes to infinity is non-zero, and uh, this is nothing but uh, through the weight. So we can consider this uh, kind of setup in the context of flux insertion. So I start from the initial state, let's say at the ground state, and then at t equals zero, I switch on the uh, constant electric field, which can be represented by uh, this vector potential, which is proportional to the time, because uh, electric field is just a time derivative of this uh, vector potential. And this, uh, yeah, so this is a uh, uh, electric field. And uh, this calligraphic AX is a vector potential you obtain uh, after the insertion at the final stage 
when time t is equal to capital T, then uh, vector potential becomes this uh, calligraphy way. And uh, in this case, so the current responds to this constant electric field. But uh, if the Drude the weight is non-zero, then uh, response to the, this Drude, the, well, the, the, this ideal response to the electric field just accumulates. So as a result, uh, the current is induced proportionally to T uh, in the presence of this Drude the weight and uh, this electric field. If you do this very, very slow, so this is uh, current induced in this setup in this adiabatic field. Okay. Then uh, now I can relate uh, this induced current with the uh, increase of the energy. There may be some question. Um, question is, can you generate this flux insertion to hold? Yeah, 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 that, that's another thing. Well, actually, uh, Laughlin did this, you know, I forgot to mention maybe that uh, this uh, whole flux insertion gauge invariance business was initiated by Laughlin. And, uh, he explained the uh, quantization of whole conductivity in this way. So I didn't have time to mention. And uh, recently I had some uh, modification or maybe improvement of uh, original Laughlin gauge argument for whole conductivity, although uh, I'm not planning to cover it today. Maybe, maybe if you are interested, you can ask me privately. Okay, so the uh, point is that, uh, so we have a current operator, current density operator, but uh, as you know, the current density operator you can obtain by uh, differentiating Hamiltonian by vector potential then you get a current operator. So the current density, you differentiate Hamiltonian by vector potential, then uh, divide by volume of the system. Volume. But uh, if you, know, you are inserting a flux at a constant rate, then vector potential is proportional to the time. So in this setting, the current operator can be related to the time derivative of the Hamiltonian. So you get some factor because uh, AX and T are related. So for adiabatic flux insertion, uh, now I want to uh, evaluate how much energy the system gains by doing this adiabatic uh, flux insertion. So you just integrate uh, uh, derivative of Hamiltonian by time because the Hamiltonian is energy and uh, integrate this uh, dH dt from t equals zero to t equal to capital T. Then you get the uh, uh, energy difference between the final state and the initial state. And uh, this energy difference is not affected by large gauge transformation. But uh, because of this relation, this dH dt can be written in terms of uh, uh, current times this dA dt, but the uh, dA dt is given by this uh, final state vector potential over this length of the process, time length of the process t, so ax over t. And then I have Jx, so I just in integrate uh, Jx from zero to t. But uh, now I assume that uh, the system may have a uh, Drude weight. Okay, the system may have a uh, zero Drude weight, but anyway, if you consider adiabatic process, then all other component of the conductivity kind of dies off. And uh, only this Drude component survives after a long time if you insert a flux very slowly. So in this case, uh, the current can be written by Drew the weight times uh, this T linear function. So you just plug in and then you can do integration. So of course you get a T square over two and then this T square cancels with this. So at the end of the day, uh, you have a relation between the energy increase to the Drude weight. So the energy increase during the 
adiabatic flux insertion, uh, delta E uh, can be, is proportional to actually do the weight. And the proportionality constant is given by volume over Lx, uh, the system size in x direction squared times uh, uh, this flux squared. Uh, we must assume T the, um, okay, right, yeah. So here I assume delta through the broadening is really zero, which is of course not the case in the realistic system, but uh, if we want to study some lattice model, well-defined lattice model, then uh, delta can be considered as infinite as well. Right? Uh, if GS, yeah, so that's a point. So yeah, okay, so last question, I'm going to uh, say something related in the next slide, so then uh, I will come back to your question, but uh, uh, if I was forgetting it, please remind me. Okay, so actually the, the, the problem is uh, uh, depends on the dimensionality, but uh, yeah, this was my uh, 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 motivation. So I assume that system has a gap. So after I, insertion of uh, two pi flux, um, the spectrum must be identical to the zero flux. But uh, as I mentioned, the, uh, in principle, by adiabatic evolution, the ground state might end up with somewhere in the excited states, in which case you must have a gap closing or level crossing between excited states and the ground state. But uh, yeah, last question is related to this. So if I assume that the gap does not cross by flux, then this cannot happen. But uh, that assumption is non-trivial. So, and actually I, I, I think sometimes this gap closing happens. Um, so, so, but uh, my point is that uh, if this kind of uh, scenario is realized, then the system gains some finite energy by non-zero energy by this adiabatic flux insertion. Then it has a non-trivial consequence on the conduction property, especially in uh, two dimensions. So, okay. sorry, I somehow I, back yeah so okay sorry I, I wanted to show this yeah. so uh, yeah especially in two dimensions this is interesting because uh, this uh, energy gain during the adiabatic evolution is related to through the weight but uh, this phi zero is just a constant two pi so it's not so important but uh, this factor is volume divided by system size in x direction squared. So if you take a isotropic system, the sizing x, y, z direction roughly the same, then this is uh, of order of length to d minus two. So actually for two dimension, uh, volume and Lx square are of the same order. So this is order one quantity, which means that the drew the weight is basically constant times uh, energy gain. So in two dimension, if you have a gap and uh, if you have gap closing and uh, your ground state evolves into some excited states by adiabatic evolution, then we can say that, okay, this system must have a uh, non-zero positive through the weight, which means that the system must be conductor in this sense. So in other words, if you assume your system is insulator, then this cannot happen. So the ground state must remain in the ground state. So in that case, uh, the non-trivial assumption I made for deep shoot matrix theorem or fractionization and so on is really satisfied. So I can replace that assumption of uh, non-gap closing by flux by the physical assumption that uh, the system is uh, insulator in the sense that uh, the weight is zero. 
so this is one way uh, I can, uh, uh, you know, justify this assumption I have made previously. Yeah. Um, so follow up on Yasha's question. Uh, there is a question on chat. Yeah, I'm still confused on the meaning of the word adiabatic for gapless systems. Well, okay, so yeah, here I, I, I'm doing this for gap system. Yeah, for gapless system, it's uh, tricky. Maybe we can still define in some way, but uh, so here I'm assuming that uh, T is, uh, uh, you know, bigger than inverse of the gap. So once you assume the existence of gap, uh, I think we can, uh, well, okay. So, well, if this happens somewhere, the gap must close. Um, well, okay. So, hmm. yeah, I, I don't know how, 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 how rigorous I can make my statement, but, um, well, in this discussion, yeah, so the T I suppose to take larger than any uh, time scale, I guess. Yeah, uh, even bigger than uh, finite size gap, uh, inverse of finite size gap in this case. Yes. Okay, yeah, maybe I'm not, yeah, answering your concern properly, but yeah, maybe we can discuss later. Okay. So, 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 okay, so, so, so from this, uh, especially in 2D, the physical assumption of a system being insulator actually restricts the possible adiabatic evolution of the system. And uh, this is the formula I derived using the uh, insertion of unit flux quantum uh, with periodic boundary condition or torus. But uh, if you go to very large system size, uh, then the vector potential is uh, unit flux quantum divided by the length of the system in x direction. So this goes to zero. So maybe you can Taylor expand this energy as a function of flux or vector potential. So if you do Taylor expansion, then uh, uh, the Drew the weight is given by the second uh, derivative of energy by vector potential. Actually, this formula has been known for very long time. So this is a famous Kohn's formula for Drew the weight uh, proposed at least in this paper. So this is very famous paper. Uh, but so, so this is kind of extension of Kohn's formula. But uh, actually this up to this point, I realized in my paper in 2003, uh, already pretty old paper. But uh, yeah, recently we realized that uh, this can be uh, more yeah, generalized. So that is, uh, uh, we can extend this idea to nonlinear electric conduction. So for a long time, uh, theorists have been mostly focused on, has, have been focusing on uh, linear responsibility, I guess, because uh, linear response is already non trivial you know, not easy to calculate conductivity. And uh, it works well. Uh, rather surprisingly, to explain many experiments, even when uh, assumption of linear response is not so obvious in experiment, but uh, in many experiments, linear response theory works very well. But uh, recently, uh, you know, uh, experimentalists developed uh, uh, laser apparatus and so on. And uh, if you shine the material by strong laser, then you can observe nonlinear effects and so on. So th there are some experimental interests recently on nonlinear effects. And uh, also theory, on theoretical side, there are also several developments. 
So nonlinear uh, electric conduction is uh, one of the topics of uh, current interest. Uh, for example, okay, so this is not directly related to our work, but uh, recently, for example, so-called shift current is discussed. So shift current means that uh, you just shine the strong laser or light to the system, which is AC electric field. But uh, this AC electric field can uh, shift, roughly speaking, positive charge and negative charge in uh, opposite direction. Then this means that uh, you can induce uh, DC current by AC electric field, which is called shift current. And uh, this has application, you know, very practical potential application to photovoltaics and so on. So this is the interesting effect. Okay, so I'm not going to sh show some result directly relevant to this shift current, but uh, sort of related. That is, if you generalize linear response theory, and uh, then you can include uh, nonlinear response that is current at time t is not only given by linear response, but the sum of uh, nth order uh, responses. So at nth order, the response is proportional to electric field, n of them, but in general at different times. So with some time delay. And uh, this uh, real time conductivity, uh, nonlinear conductivity, is a function of n times, n delay times. And uh, if you convert this and the sum over n, then you should be, at, in principle, you should be able to obtain the current induced by electric field, including the uh, higher order nonlinear conductivities. And uh, once you have this nonlinear conductivity, then you can also uh, define the uh, Nonlinear uh, generalization of through the weights. So that is, uh, so yeah, my uh, notation is not always clear, but uh, I hope it's uh, understandable. So here, the conductivity is a function of real time, delay times. And uh, when you send delay times to infinity, then in relaxation system, the response would die, so it would go to zero. But if you have a perfect conductor or something, then once you induce a current, then some of the current survives for infinite long time. And uh, this limit represents a portion of nonlinear current induced by electric field, which survives for infinitely long time. So this is a nonlinear generalization of through the weight. Then uh, I can repeat uh, basically the same analysis. That is, I do the uh, adiabatic uh, flux insertion according to the same linear schedule. But uh, now, uh, the, the, now I can include the nonlinear part of the current, which is proportional to the uh, nth power of the electric field. And uh, after a long time, uh, only this through the part survives. So n soda nonlinear through the weight times uh, uh, this uh, power of n power of electric field, and then uh, times t to the power n because the uh, effect accumulates as you continue inserting the flux. So this is again a generalization of uh, previous. Uh, linear conductivity analysis to nonlinear ones. Then I can relate the uh, uh, n plus one's order of energy gain during this adiabatic energy insertion uh, to the n order current contribution to the uh, increase of energy. So again, uh, dH dt can be related to the current, but the uh, current is sum over all order contribution. So I'm just picking up uh, nth order uh, response current to the electric field. Then because of this nth order current has this uh, particular time dependence, uh, you can integrate over time t, then you get uh, the capital T, which is a uh, length of the 
adiabatic insertion process to n plus one's power uh, divided by n plus one, but uh, this t power of t just cancel with this uh, denominator, which appears as a uh, strength of the electric field. So at the end of the day, uh, the higher order term. I, I, t, yeah. You get the. Uh, um, sorry, the question was the, the, is that the last question? Is it obvious that the nonlinear derivative is independent of the order? Um, well, it's not obvious, I guess, but uh, physically, I think it's natural. So this represents, uh, you know, so so if you apply electric field, this electric field induces some current. And as you wait for very long time, some of the current will just uh, go away, but uh, some portion of the current will survive. And uh, this is measuring how, how much current is surviving and uh, well so okay so in this definition of nonlinear conductivity you know all the uh, time uh, arguments enters in uh, equal footing i guess so um well still okay i'm not making mathematically rigorous discussion. So you, I guess uh, in very rigorous sense, the still I'm, I'm missing some maybe possibility that uh, this limit depends on the order of limits, but uh, uh, physically I don't expect such dependence. Um, the, okay, I, sorry, and then I was missing another question. So question from Pavel, can you give an example of a gap system where gap closes and reopens and that? Yeah, good question. So, sorry, I, 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 I was thinking of mentioning this, but then forgotten. So, um, so in, as, as I said, in principle, the gap can close and then ground state may end up with uh, 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 excited state. And uh, I think there is, Okay, this two them. Well, two them. well, yeah. The the example I thought about. Okay, so well, first I don't know any really established example like uh, some model which shows a gap closing at intermediate value of phi numerically or something. But uh, what I thought as a possible example, or maybe uh, uh, is that, uh, okay, now I'm not so sure if I can realize this in 2D, but um, uh, anyway, so suppose you have superconductor, uh, and uh, if you have attractive Hubbard or something, then, you know, uh, the system shows uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking in superconductivity phase, superfluid phase. So you must have a gapless num goes on mode. So you have a gapless system and that's it. But uh, suppose your system uh, is superconductor coupled to the physical electromagnetic field. Then as we know, uh, uh, because of the Higgs mechanism or Anderson Higgs mechanism, the superconductor doesn't have a gap. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, superconductor has a gap. So the number goes on mode would present if we don't consider coupling to gauge field. But once we couple to gauge field, then somehow this uh, dynamical gauge field absorbs the uh, gapless number goes on mode that we have a gap. And I think in this case, we have a gap, but uh, uh, we have a non-zero superfluid density. Then the through the weight must be bigger than superfluid density. So we have uh, non-zero through the weight and gap. In that case, I think uh, this gap closing should occur from this discussion. But uh, I, I, I haven't verified with concrete model. Um, 
I don't know any numerical verification of such thing, but、uh, that, that's the example of gap closing I can think of.、Um, okay, Yasha made a comment. Affleck Marston Pipefrac state might be an example.、Uh, isn't it gapless? Or maybe I misunderstood your, what you are saying. Yeah, maybe we can discuss later. So, okay, where are we? Okay, so anyway, so the, what we did here is that、uh, we considered the same flux insertion process and、uh, then measured how much energy you gain. And、uh, energy gain is related to DHDT. Uh, time derivative of Hamiltonian, but、uh, that can be related to the current. So, if you consider higher order response of the current to the electric field, you obtain the higher order correction to the、uh, energy gain during the、uh, adiabatic flux insertion. So, then if you equate the energy dependence,、uh, sorry, flux or Vector potential dependence of the energy eigen value, then you can relate the、uh, higher order nonlinear d r e w d e v a t e to the higher order derivative of the energy as a function of flux or vector potential. So, the, if you set n equals one, this is a very well known con formula for d r e w d e v a t e but、uh, similar. Very compact formula can be obtained for the nonlinear generalization of the d r e w d e v a t e Okay. So, yeah, I'm close to running out of time, but、uh, there are some questions. And、uh, yeah, at the start, I had some problems. So <laughs> I hope I can continue for 10 minutes or so. That, that's fine. Continue、yeah. for a while. We've got plenty of time today. Yeah. yeah okay. So, So far, I have discussed the、uh, uh, adiabatic flux insertion. But uh, actually, uh, you can do flux insertion at different speeds,、uh, like a finite time or so on. But、uh, it's also useful to consider、uh, the opposite limit. That is,、uh, yeah, this is the、uh, opposite limit to adiabatic flux insertion. So, in adiabatic flux insertion, you、uh, insert a flux very, very slowly, taking very, very long time. But、uh, here, I consider a similar process. So,、uh, vector potential is proportional to time t、uh, over period of、uh, time capital T. But、uh, I can now send this、uh, period of、uh, length of the adiabatic,、uh, sorry, flux insertion process to zero. Then that means that、uh, I suddenly insert a flux instantly. Bang.、Um, this physically corresponds to、uh, applying the delta function electric field pulse to the system. And uh, uh, what, is,、uh, what becomes easy in this limit is that、uh, you know, this is a, a typical. Uh, case of the so called sudden、uh, switching or quantum quench. So you had zero flux Hamiltonian, zero vector potential Hamiltonian, and、uh, you had a ground state. But at t equals zero, you suddenly switch on the vector potential. So at t bigger than zero, you have different Hamiltonian, including the vector potential. So this is a、uh, uh, uh, variation of quantum quench. And、uh, in this case,、uh, just, just after applying the flux,、uh, the wave function does not change because、uh, basically the wave function cannot catch up with the sudden change in the Hamiltonian. So, this is、uh, something called sudden approximation in the standard quantum mechanics textbook. But the、uh, point is that、uh, again, you know,、uh, we can say that okay, I switch on the flux suddenly, but the wave function cannot catch up. So the wave function remains the same as before, but、uh, we are in a different gauge. So, in order to make a meaningful comparison, 
you should apply the uh, uh, large gauge translation. So the initial state was ground state, and by sudden switching on the flux, uh, the wave function remains in the same state, but in the different gauge. So you apply the large gauge transformation to original ground state. Then this is a post quench state after uh, inserting the flux instantly then doing the gauge transformation. And uh, interestingly, you can play the same game that is, uh, okay, so it happens instantly but uh, the system still gains some energy and uh, you can try to evaluate. So on one hand, um, again, the energy increase is nothing but the dh dt uh, integrated and the dh dt can be related to the current by the same logic because the current is derivative of Hamiltonian by vector potential and the vector potential is proportional to time. So now you want to integrate uh, this Jx over time and the Jx, uh, including the nonlinear responses can be written generally in this way. The real time conductivity, nonlinear conductivity times uh, n power of the electric field because uh, we have constant electric field throughout the process and uh, do the integral. But uh, now we consider the limit of uh, uh, sudden insertion is capital T goes to zero. Then uh, of course, uh, oops, oh yeah, this is right. So the arguments of this uh, real time conductivity, which represents the delay of the response uh, is also between zero and capital T because we are considering very short uh, period of time. So if this function is some continuous function of time, then in this uh, sudden insertion limit, basically we only pick up a uh, value of this uh, conductivity at zero delay time. Because uh, you know, I insert a flux suddenly, that means that uh, I apply the delta function like uh, electric field pulse, but I want to know the value of current only during very short period of time. So I don't need any information about uh, delayed response. I only need uh, information about the uh, instantaneous response, which is nothing but uh, this uh, N-soda conductivity at uh, zero time delay. And uh, I have n power of electric field. And uh, again, the effect accumulates. So I have uh, time T to n power. But then I can plug in this formula here, then do the integral easy. And uh, on the other side of the equation, I need an uh, energy increase caused by the uh, sudden insertion of the uh, flux. But uh, actually this has a nice uh, expression because as I said, uh, uh, after the insertion of flux, sudden insertion of the flux and then large gauge transformation, the state wave function becomes a ux times the original ground state. So after the insertion, the energy expectation value can be written like this, psi zero u dagger times Hamiltonian times u psi zero. And uh, this can be also interpreted as the uh, ground state expectation value of the uh, gauge transformed Hamiltonian, u dagger h u. So this is nothing but the uh, expectation of Hamiltonian in the presence of flux by the original ground state. So we just pick up a difference from the original ground state, which is uh, Hamiltonian in the presence of this flux minus original Hamiltonian. Then you take the expectation value with respect to the ground state. So if you are familiar with the original paper by Liebschut and Matisse, actually this is nothing but uh, deep shoot matrix variational energy. Uh, but uh, here, I, we can interpret this energy as a uh, energy increase caused by the sudden insertion of the flux. So again, you can equate uh, these two sides and uh, match order by order. Then you found the uh, 
relation between this uh, instantaneous response, uh, so, so the zero time delay uh, nonlinear conductivity to the uh, uh, n plus one's order derivative of Hamiltonian with respect to the vector potential, then set vector potential to zero. Then you take the uh, expectation value of this guy by the original gram set. So this is different from the uh, cone formula because uh, in cone formula, you take the derivative uh, of the energy eigenvalue. But uh, here you take derivative of Hamiltonian as an operator, then take the expectation value by the ground set. So they look similar, but uh, different. And uh, by the way, this uh, instantaneous response uh, can be written in frequency space as a frequency integral. Uh, because uh, basically instantaneous response in real time corresponds to uh, frequency integral over minus infinity to plus infinity. So this actually is nothing but uh, uh, so-called F sum rule of conductivity. And again, the linear, uh, this F sum rule for linear conductivity is well known, has been discussed over many years. And uh, you can reproduce the well known F sum rule for linear conductivity by putting n equals one. But uh, here uh, I automatically obtain the uh, F sum rule for at every order of nonlinear conductivity, like a second order, third order, fourth order, whatever. Yeah. And uh, actually, there, there are some discussion by Shimizu um, around 2010, 2011. But uh, we think this is uh, more general. And uh, also, in this way, uh, it has very similar looking form to the cone formula, nonlinear generalization of formula, but uh, they are different quantities and uh, their physical meanings are different. So, um, so, we, so these are very general results, but uh, we did try to test this formula in tight binding model. Okay, so this is tight binding model, so simple system, but uh, still calculation of nonlinear conductivity is not totally trivial. So this is a nonlinear conductivity in xx direction as a function of two frequencies, omega one, omega two. So you have some peaks and uh, this is a uh, linear conductivity as a function of frequency. And uh, this uh, peak in the center is a uh, uh, through the peak. And uh, yeah, you end up. So, so here I think, uh, yeah, this calculation done by Haruki. So I don't uh, fully grasp the details, but uh, this peak apparently has a finite width, but uh, this is uh, because uh, he put some artificial widths in the calculation to, to make the calculation sensible. So this is basically delta function peak. And uh, we can identify the through the weight by the magnitude of this peak. And uh, yeah, also here. So this is the uh, uh, double delta function peak in the uh, uh, second order nonlinear conductance. And uh, by this amplitude, we can identify the um, uh, nonlinear through the weight. And uh, okay, so this is uh, small, but um, so, so he calculated the uh, uh, through the weight for linear response and the F sum frequency integral for linear response. And uh, we can compare with uh, this uh, formula, cone formula and uh, Epsom formula. Well, th this part is not so new, but uh, uh, they agree up to three digits or something. And uh, now we can also compare second order response, uh, the numerically obtained value versus the nonlinear generalization of the cone formula and uh, numerical frequency integral uh, versus the uh, nonlinear generalization of the epsilon blue. So now the agreement is not as good as the linear one, naturally, but uh, still we have uh, agreement up to two digits or something. So we hope that uh, this epsilon rule and maybe uh, this uh, nonlinear cone formula could be useful 
uh, for example, to check numerical calculation. So this is type binding model. So uh, perhaps there is uh, not much room for mistakes or uh, subtle errors, but uh, if you are going to study more non-trivial interacting models, then uh, having this kind of general constraint can be useful, at least as a cross-check. Uh, yeah, there is a question from Yasha. Can you elaborate on how you do? Okay. Sorry. Uh, yeah, you should ask Haruki. <laughs> Sorry, I just, <laughs> I just uh, copied his result. I have to confess. But, uh, well, yeah, this is, yeah, we have exact Hamiltonian, so I, I don't think he has used uh, something like Kyrgyz, just a straightforward calculation. Yeah. Okay, so to summarize, um, yeah, in the latter part of my talk, uh, we obtained uh, two very general formulas for nonlinear conductivity. And uh, one of them is uh, F-sum rule, uh, generalization to nonlinear ones, which naturally contains a linear F-sum rule, which has been known for a long time. But uh, it has very natural uh, generalization in uh, this compact expression. And uh, the other main result is the generalization of cone formula for nonlinear generalization of Drude weight. Uh, which corresponds to a uh, coefficient of one over omega pole in frequency space. And uh, this nonlinear Drude derivative has very similar uh, expression as uh, epsilon. Oh, maybe I need one over V here. Anyway, uh, very similar, but uh, their meaning is different because uh, in the cone formula, you need to find the energy eigenvalue, eigenvalue as a function of uh, flux or vector potential then take derivative, higher order derivative. But in F sum rule, you have a Hamiltonian as an operator, which depends on the flux of vector potential. Then you take derivative with respect to the vector potential for this Hamiltonian as operator. Then after that, you take the expectation value with respect to the original ground state. So these two formula look uh, very similar, but uh, rather different. And uh, this difference actually come from the, you know, physical, uh, very different physical processes we are considering. So if some rule corresponds to the instantaneous response, so I just do the sudden insertion of the flux. So as a consequence of this sudden approximation, uh, which becomes exact, I have this uh, formula. Uh, first take derivative of Hamiltonian, then take expectation value. But the cone formula corresponds to the very long term time response. So you do the adiabatic insertion. So then basically by inserting the flux, you follow the eigenstate. So you track the change of the uh, eigenvalue of the Hamiltonian. So corresponding to that adiabatic insertion, you must take the derivative of the energy eigenvalue as a function of the vector potential as a flux. So, okay, so this uh, flux insertion business looks very simple and uh, to some extent trivial, but uh, yeah, there are, there are still some new applications coming out. So thanks for your attention. Let's unmute and thank uh, Masaki for his talk. Thank you. Okay, we have a number. Of, we have a number of questions here. Uh, Dominic Elsa, first question. Uh, hello. Yeah, I, I wanted to come back to this uh, question of sort of the gap closing during the mm -hmm. flux mm -hmm. insertion. Mm -hmm. uh, I was, I was still kind of unclear on how how this could happen because like the, the gap is really a usually a local property. Of the right. System. Yeah. But, but so, the, the, the flux is a very global property, so it doesn't seem like the gap should, should see the flux at all. Right, yeah. So I think, yeah, under some assumptions, we should be able to prove. Okay, so in some sense, you know, Hastings has a proof for Lipschitz matrix itself uh, without using this assumption. Um, so uh, in my understanding, his... Uh, 
Hastings proof for deep shoot matrix theorem does not directly prove this uh, protection of the gap, but uh, sort of supporting evidence, I would say. And uh, also, uh, Haruki Watanabe has a recent paper in which he shows that uh, uh, much of the macroscopic properties of the system is insensitive to the flux insertion of the change of the boundary condition. Uh, but uh, he hasn't completely proved that uh, the gap is protected, but uh, he did show that uh, uh, the gap to the excited states, which you can access by local operators, applying the uh, local operators, should be protected or something like that. So the, well, if that is the case, then maybe the only remaining possibility is that uh, uh, topological, uh, uh, hmm, let's say, well, yeah, some kind of topological excitation, but again, topological excitation should be insensitive to local perturbation. So, okay, so I tend to agree with you, but uh, on the other hand, uh, I mentioned the example of uh, superconductor coupled to the gauge field, which corresponds to longer in interaction. So I guess our in intuition somehow depends on the locality of the interaction. So once you include long range interaction, somewhere this uh, gap protection uh, hypothesis would collapse, I guess, but uh, how long range interaction exactly we need, I, I, I have no idea. But uh, yeah, for short range interaction, I agree. Yeah, at least my intuition agrees with you. Yeah, thank you. I have a question from uh, Yang Ji Chu. Hi, Masaki. Thank you for yeah. your talk. Um, my question is about the translational symmetry. It seems mm -hmm. that you need, a, you need a translational invariant to have yeah. this result. And uh, yeah. interest is about thinking about like uh, Anderson localization or other disorders. Uh -huh. I'm wondering, mm -hmm. uh, the motivation is that uh, sometimes they have vanished in linear response uh, uh -huh. but they might have nonlinear connectivity. I'm just uh -huh. curious if your new established method can help us understand those, uh, for instance, uh, nonlinear to the way. Yeah, so, okay. So, uh, yeah, maybe uh, my presentation was not good, but uh, so this part depends on the translation symmetry, but the uh, latter half of my talk, um, Yeah, these are uh, main. So, so this part does not, as far as I can see, does not depend on the uh, uh, translation invariance or anything. So we can apply this to uh, localized system. Yeah, uh, yeah, that could be interesting. Yeah, actually, we we or uh, Haruki has done a little bit of uh, computation on a uh, simple model of. Uh, uh, disorder system, but uh, uh, yeah, we, we, yeah, we still don't have uh, uh, you know much understanding about the subject. But uh, yeah, this should be applicable to this part should be applicable to uh, disorder system without any transition symmetry. So that would be interesting application. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, we have a, a question from Sreji. Uh, Sreji. Uh, Chuli para villain. Sreji, you can ask the question. Uh, can you go to the slide of uh, gap protected uh, where you made an argument about two dimensions? This yeah, one? This one. Yeah. So even in higher dimensions, when you mm -hmm. suppose there is gap closing, mm -hmm. if uh, if the there will be a positive energy gain, right? Mm -hmm. So delta epsilon is still positive. So this means that uh, D has to be positive, right? Well, but uh, it might scale like a uh, one over L or something. Uh, yeah, but. Yeah, so, yeah, so if we, um, yeah, so if we, uh, uh, how to say, uh, enlarge the definition of the uh, insulator or, 
make it strict uh, which way. Uh, anyway, yeah, so so even in three dimension, yeah, this might be useful to 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 derive some results. Yeah, actually, I remember Ashwin and uh, Arun had the paper uh, basically applying this flux insertion type argument to bosonic system. And I think he, they, they, are, they argue that uh, even in three dimension, essentially my statement should hold or something. Uh, but I, mm -hmm. I didn't quite understand the uh, argument, but uh, yeah. So, in two so, dimensions, yeah. Mm -hmm. if you start with a system which has uh, some electrons mm -hmm. over the gap as well, and then when you do the uh, adiabatic flux insertion, and if there mm -hmm. is gap closing, mm -hmm. and if those same states, which has electrons in the, above the gap, come mm -hmm. down, and mm -hmm. the states below go up, which were also occupied, then we would have an energy gain of zero rate. But that doesn't uh, show that it's an insulator or a conductor. Um, so, 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 so you, you, you start from not the ground state, but some, um, uh, I'm looking at the system which is filled so that, uh, it has, uh, electrons even above the gap. Oh, but, but like you, you mean, uh, uh, you mean by above the gap, the single particle spectrum, single, sing, single electron spectrum has a gap and uh, you put some electrons above this gap. Yes. That's what you mean. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, here, this gap is a many body gap. So maybe we should uh, distinguish uh, many body gap from the single particle gap. But, uh, um, well, so, yeah, I, I don't know if I, I have a good answer to your question, but uh, so in this talk, I focused on the ground state because uh, it's easier to discuss. But uh, this kind of argument is also applicable to finite temperature states and so on. So if you have uh, a finite temperature, then yeah. have a uh, Gibbs distribution, you know, so many, many eigenstates contribute with some probability. And for each eigenstate, we can uh, track the uh, energy eigenvalue as a function of flux, then take derivative. And then uh, we consider statistical average with the same weight because the adiabatic evolution of uh, Gibbs state shouldn't change the you know, probability of each state. So if you define the... Uh, yeah. No, uh, I was actually thinking like in the ground state, can't the system have electrons both below the gap as well as some above the gap? Like That's the... a single particle gap, yeah. yeah uh, we have quite a few other questions. Um, maybe we can... Uh, Hang on, please. Okay, maybe, maybe we can discuss later. Yeah, yeah sorry. Okay. I... Yeah, so, sure. Judli has asked a question. Hang on. So I got yeah. So Chang Li Huang asked. Uh, oh, in a uh, chat window. Okay. Yeah. Very simple question. In your summary slides, uh, can you comment on the Hermann Feynman theorem? Okay. Uh, um okay yeah good question uh i guess it's it's yeah it's related um um let's see uh, okay so thinking one Definition. Okay, so one one thing I can say is that the um, uh, yeah, this con so 
So one thing I can say is that I didn't fully explain the um, derivation, but uh, uh, I related the energy increase to the derivative uh, integration over derivative of Hamiltonian. But uh, this relation is not totally trivial. And uh, because uh, in general, the wave function is also developing, ev evolving over time. And the Hamiltonian is also evolving over time. Um, but actually, energy increase can be related to the uh, expectation value of Hamiltonian uh, dhdt by the uh, uh, wave function with respect to the wave function at that time. So to be precise, I should write the uh, expectation value with respect to psi of t, to be precise. Uh, but uh, this equality is something like a uh, Hellman Feynman theorem. It's not completely trivial, but uh, if you write down the equation, you can check this uh, equality hole. So, so in that sense, yeah, uh, kind of related to Hellman Feynman theorem, although uh, the final result may not be exactly Hellman Feynman theorem or its consequence, but uh, I guess it's uh, at least uh, sort of related result. Okay, uh, he's had his hand up for a while. Yosha Komajani, question next. Uh, hi. So I, I also have a question about the linear part of your, your story. So independent of whether there is a gap in the system or not, I, I guess we can do the adiabatic flux insertion and we will end up with the same spectrum as had before. But if we do it too fast, we are disturbing the equilibrium, right? So, mm -hmm. so I, I guess there must be some sweet spot for or some window of parameter where your where capital T can be, right? It ca it can it cannot be too long because you don't want the current to be dissipated. It cannot be too short because then you will be violate the equilibration. So I'm just wondering, can you put some bound on this? Yeah, so maybe your question is about the situation where uh, delta is uh, actually finite in... in right, uh, so, so one limit that... from there, exactly. T has to be larger than one over delta, but yeah. what about liberation? Can we talk about that form? Because it cannot be, yeah. So, so, yeah. Ah, so, okay. So those factors. Okay. So this analysis, um, we are thinking about very idealized model, like a Hubbard model or something, hmm. uh, which has uh, drew the weight with really delta equals to infinitesimal. But uh, as you say, in realistic systems, there must be some finite delta and also finite relaxation uh, to the new equilibrium. Yes. So, yes, so um, I guess the... But, sorry, another thing is that we, are, we don't have a gap to protect us. So, so with a capital, I mean, no matter how large is capital T, there will be mm -hmm. some deviation from equilibrium. And then the linear response formula cannot be really applied. Um, you mean the finite flux changes the equilibrium? Is right. that what you mean? Um, well, maybe I'm wrong, but my understanding is that uh, this uh, entire formulation, uh, okay, so, 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 we just start from some equilibrium state or ground state for given Hamiltonian, then apply electric field and uh, see how much current is flowing as a response to this electric field. So uh, this formulation does not take the uh, relaxation into account at least explicitly. Um, yeah, any problem with this? So, so of course, if in in the arctic system, real material, uh, there should be some you know extra coupling to 
external environment in addition to this kind of spectrum. Uh, then, yeah, there are relaxations. So, well, yeah, so I guess uh, in that case, these formulas are only valid up to time less than the relaxation time scale. Yeah, I sort of agree with you said, yeah. But uh, here we are considering very idealized model with zero coupling to the environment, then we can take T to infinity, but uh, of course that's not, not uh, realistic for actual material. So there will be some trade-off. We, we, we haven't really figured out that, but I, I agree with your observations. So we're kind of into the break period, but if we've got time for two brief questions, one from Tamagna Hazra and one from Pavel Volkov. So Tamagna, you go first. Uh, hi. So uh, I have a question about this slide. Um, uh, okay. So I, I, I guess, uh, uh, so when you say epsilon naught, that's the many body ground state energy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, so the Hamiltonian is, is defined by the minimum ground state energies and the wave functions. So mm -hmm. it seems like the long time response is mm -hmm. independent of whatever the wave functions are doing. Is there some intuitive way to understand why the wave functions of the Hamiltonian drop uh -huh. out of the second part? Mm, yeah, okay. Uh, good question. Mm. Um, I don't know. So yeah, it's highly non-trivial, but uh, basically, mm, I guess this is because uh, we have this formula, uh, this Hamiltonian, uh, the, the current. So so here we are only considering the uniform current. So if you consider a uh, response at finite wave vector, then I think the situation is completely different. Probably you also need wave function. But uh, here I am only considering the response of the uniform current q, q equals zero to uniform electric field q equals zero. So in that case, uh, the current can be uh, related to the time derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to the insertion of the flux, yes. as I showed uh, part of the derivation. So essentially that special relation is behind this result. Yeah, I, I agree. So in, in generic physical quantity, we should need uh, information about wave function, but here only eigenvalue is needed because of the uh, relation between the uniform current and the time derivative of the Hamilton. I see. And you, you made no assumptions about whether the system is topological or non-topological. So no, guess... no, no. Yeah, we, we didn't assume anything here. Yeah, just... Uh, Basically, the assumption is just that uh, you can, you know, dip, you you can write down the uh, current as a response to the electric field up to infinite order. Uh, but uh, that should be at least physically reasonable. Although mathematically maybe highly not to be, but uh, physically that's what we expect. All right, yes. and one last question from Pavel Volkov. Oh. Uh, my question is about the first part of the talk where, where yeah. you had uh, the adiabatic flux insertion for a system mm -hmm. with some partial occupation. So mm -hmm. uh, if you have a mod insulator, in principle, you're at half filling, right? Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. so this argument would tell you that the ground state momentum has changed and hence mm -hmm. uh, it's either gapless, which it is not, or it has a ground state degeneracy. Uh, but in principle, it, 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 it also needn't be the case. So can you explain how this works in the mod insulator case? Uh, you mean the spin full electron with yes. uh, half field means that uh, uh, so, so each side can uh, accommodate uh, up and down spin electron, yes. but uh, yeah. one electron per side. Yeah, in that case, um, well, motor insulator does have uh, degeneracy because uh, if you have nail states, then mm -hmm. you know you have up, down, up, down, uh, down, up, down, up, and uh, yeah, if you form CDW, uh, 
So if you form CDW, you change the periodicity. So it could be that that this this shift of the momentum is actually trivial. But if you don't break... well, 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 but but uh, well, so so my statement is that if Hamiltonian has the symmetry, okay, so um, yeah, so this CDW or nail uh, uh, is part of this Q4 degenerate ground state. So uh -huh. so this statement applies when you have uh, um, uh, periodicity translation invariance of Hamiltonian. So the nail state or CW state uh, enlarges the unit cell, but uh, it's due to spontaneous symmetry breaking. Then spontaneous symmetry breaking must accompany the ground state degeneracy. So this theorem says that if you have half field uh, system, then you know you, you have to, if you want to open the gap, you must produce the ground state degeneracy in one way or another. And uh, nail or CDW uh, you know, possibilities, uh, which, are, which uh, is uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking, which accompanies uh, ground state degeneracy. So that's uh, consistent with this theorem. So what this theorem forbids is that uh, you cannot just open the gap without any spontaneous symmetry breaking or towards the open. Well, if you consider a state which doesn't break a symmetry like, like an RVB state, still it will have some ground state to generate. Well, yeah, that, that's a, yeah, that, that, yeah, that's an interesting part. So, so the RVB type spin digit seems to contradict with this statement, but actually this theorem only applies uh, to torus or a periodic boundary condition. Then RVB type spin uh, spin digit should have a so-called topological degeneracy, mm -hmm. which is also consistent with this. So this theorem says that uh, you must have uh, either spontaneous symmetry breaking uh, that is conventional kind of order like a nail or a CW, or you must have a topological topological order in order to open the gap. Thank so, you. Yeah. That is a wonderful point to end on. Uh, these are very powerful theorems, and thank you so much for telling us all about them, Masaki. It was a wonderful talk. Let's thank Masaki for this great presentation. Then, Thanks, Masaki. Thank you. Thank you. You stayed up late at night on all these occasions, remarkable, um, and remain sharp. That's great. So now we're into the break period. Um, it's 10, well, it's 38 minutes past the hour. Um, we'll go into breakout rooms for 15 minutes or so, and the next talk will resume uh, at uh, 4 o'clock London local time. Thank you very much and uh, see you in the breakout rooms.
Anybody left here?
How are you, Chi Miao? Come on, me, Pierce. Yeah. How are you? I'm not hearing you. You're not hearing me. I don't know why. Um, Pierce, do you hear me? I hear you, yes. Uh, but you don't hear me somehow. Uh, I'm I not hearing you anymore. Um, does anyone else hear me? Sam, can you unmute? I, I hear you, Pierce. Hello. Hi, Chi Miao. Chi Miao may not be hearing us. Yeah, okay. Um, I will uh, chat with him. Uh, we are not, you are not hearing us. Yeah. You are not hearing us. But we hear you. Okay, great. I can hear you now. Okay, very good. Excellent. How are you, Pierce? Good. Oh, hi, Herbert. Good afternoon. You too. <laughs> <laughs> How are things in Houston? We hear that you have a spike going on there. Yeah, we hear that too. We don't. We don't really go out, so. No. You don't know. Yes. We don't really know, but uh, doesn't sound very good. Yeah. Let me share. I guess New Jersey is much better now, right? We, we think so. We're just, you know, I had my hair cut, so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you have to do the remote haircut, Pierce. No, 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 no. I've never done that. <laughs> I, I did it. <laughs> when, uh... <laughs> so who did the snipping? You did it or? or no, did... no, Denise did it. Denise did it. I see. <laughs> 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 but there was under the expert guidance. I'm not seeing the... <laughs> Let's see. Share. Good. Okay, very good. And see if you can advance, see if you can show the, uh, can, well, you, can you advance your screen? Yeah, I think it's good. That's good. Okay, okay. very good. That was great. Okay, we'll give it a couple of minutes and then we'll mm -hmm. be on the races. All right. So what's going to, what's the grand finale party going to be like? Yeah, good question. Um, traditionally at, at uh, Condensed Madam City, we go to the Jack Horner on the corner. And then we all go out for dinner afterwards. That's the one thing we can't do. Um, take you to the Oxo restaurant overlooking the Thames, or do you remember going there? <laughs> I think every business establishment must establish their presence virtually. Yes. I have a cold beer in the fridge. <laughs> okay, good. Okay. <laughs> You're, you're very well prepared. Well, you're in the right time zone for, for drinking a beer, uh, Frank. Um, here, we're at the middle of the day. It's, uh, and also I'm at the lab, so I forgot to bring my beer with me. So um, I'll have to have tea, I'm afraid. Um, <laughs> all right. I think everyone is back with us. Um, All right. Um, I think we're going to get going. Well, welcome back, everyone. Uh, welcome to what is, in fact, the very last talk of condensed matter in all the cities. Um, this is the last day, the last talk of the last day. We've been going for nine days solidly, um, and we've only crashed the internet twice, so that's pretty good. Um, we're very happy to welcome back Chi Miao, Chi Miao Si, uh, for his last talk today. 
For those of you who didn't attend his earlier talk, uh, Chi Miao is a professor of physics at Rice University. Um, he uh, did his undergraduate training at the USTC in China uh, before going on as a PhD student to the University of Chicago. Um, I've known him well since he came to Rutgers as a postdoc in the, uh, in the uh, 90s, uh, where he beca became very well known for working extremely long hours. You'd come here at 12 o'clock at night and Chi Miao was working away. Um, I don't know whether he still does that nowadays now he's at Rice, but I suspect so. Um, uh, he uh, uh, has uh, various, he's been a Humboldt fellow. He's uh, also been an ULAM scholar at Los Alamos National Laboratory. Um, and uh, well, I think with that, I will uh, hand over to him. He's gonna give us a talk today on iron base to Moiré systems, bad metals and electronic order, nematicity from iron nictides to Moiré systems. Thank you, Chi Miao, for being here. Um, thank you, Piers, for the kind introduction. And uh, indeed, thanks to all the organizers for nine days uh, for wonderfully running this uh, event. Uh, uh, I really enjoyed uh, listening to the, uh, the talks of the short talks of the junior people, uh, among uh, other things in the program. Um, so uh, this is uh, the, the title of the talk, uh, Bad Metals and uh, Electronic Orders, Nematicity from uh, Ion Nictides for Mori uh, Systems. So the plan is, uh, first of all, to uh, continue on uh, to the some of the more uh, specific uh, aspects uh, of what uh, I talked about a week ago uh, on the uh, ion-based uh, uh, CPU conductors. Uh, I decided uh, just to uh, focus almost exclusively on the electronic orders with uh, uh, emphasis on its connection, their connection to the bad metal uh, 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 physics and uh, the phenomenology and with a particular emphasis on the uh, pneumatic orders uh, and the implications for uh, correlation physics. And then uh, I would like to uh, uh, present uh, uh, for the first time actually, uh, so I hope uh, uh, to get good uh, uh, feedback and discussions on the uh, more uh, narrow band systems uh, uh, particularly on the pneumatic correlations with uh, uh, an emphasis on the role of uh, uh, fragile insulators and bad metals terms, which I will uh, explain uh, what I mean. So uh, I think I listed most of these collaborators uh, last time. Uh, uh, this time I would particularly like to highlight the contribution of Lai Chen, who is a, a second year finished uh, second year graduate school at Rice. And uh, together with Hao Yu, who is the middle of the graduate program here. And uh, with Wen Jun Hu uh, and uh, Rong Yu and Emil Nika. And also I would like to highlight the uh, collaboration that uh, uh, I've started uh, uh, with uh, Federico Becker from uh, Trieste. So, uh, if one looks at a uh, uh, variety of uh, core electron systems, one sees a lot of things, uh, but uh, perhaps one uh, very apparent feature uh, is the prevalence of uh, electronic orders of different kinds, once in particular besides uh, uh, super connectivity. And uh, so this, uh, it goes to the heavy fermion systems, such as this uh, serial based material with uh, magnetic quadrupolar orders uh, in the phase diagram sequence of uh, uh, quantum uh, uh, criticality. Uh, cooperates is a famous uh, uh, interplay of uh, a variety of uh, orders. Uh, the uh, uh, C60 based materials perhaps uh, have been less well uh, recognized as also hosting uh, magnetic orders uh, 
and CPU connectivity adjacent to that. And uh, of course, uh, the, the memory systems uh, is uh, currently of uh, uh, extensive uh, interest. And uh, so uh, one could uh, stare at uh, such a uh, uh, rich landscape of uh, electronic orders and ask uh, what uh, they mean. And I want to uh, make a point that they uh, in fact uh, provide clues to the underlying correlation physics. And I'll illustrate that. Uh, so I'll start from uh, the continuation of what I talked about last time, uh, which is uh, the electronic orders uh, in ion nictites. Uh, but uh, 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 let me sort of uh, uh, introduce uh, this uh, with uh, uh, a few slides of what I showed last time. And uh, so uh, from very early on, in the canonical cases such as uh, the ion uh, asynchronites, we know that uh, uh, superconductivity appears in the vicinity of anti fellow magnetic order, uh, which uh, is accompanied by uh, tetragonal to orthorhombic structural phase transition that has by now been very well established as uh, uh, being a proxy of underlying electronic uh, pneumatic order. And uh, uh, we want to look at uh, such uh, uh, order and ask question, uh, how do we uh, think about it? And later on ask the question, uh, can we uh, sort of uh, uh, go backwards and uh, learn from uh, the electronic orders about the underlying uh, uh, electron correlation physics. But for now, uh, the presence of electronic order is part of the phase diagram. Uh, of these systems, but uh, we also, uh, and, I, and I, as I did uh, last time, uh, we want to uh, stress that uh, these uh, systems are very uh, correlated. Uh, they are, uh, 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 and that has implications for how to think about spin degrees freedoms. These are spin degrees freedoms, uh, uh, which I advocate to be primarily uh, coming from interaction induced incoherent part of electronic excitations. So uh, the bad metal behavior uh, as uh, uh, defined by room temperature resistivity being large, uh, that was known from the very beginning. I mentioned some of the visualization by, by spectroscopy uh, last time uh, from Jude weight reduction, uh, up as uh, inferred mass enhancement uh, and the, the various other features, but uh, um, in particular, uh, I think the orbital selective aspects, at least uh, it's a feature uh, that signifies that uh, uh, these systems are uh, very strongly uh, correlated. And so I'm not gonna repeat that. Uh, uh, so uh, picking up on that thread, the statement is that the incoherent part of the electron spectral weight is in fact larger than the coherent part of the electron spectral weight. And uh, uh, therefore, uh, to the zeroth order, uh, we want to uh, uh, think about the incoherent uh, contribution, incoherent electron weight contributions to the uh, spin degree freedom and uh, 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 incorporate uh, the coherent weight, uh, effect of the coherent weight. Uh, uh, ich schon order by order. Order. Um, so, uh, so this is a, probably the last slide of what I showed last time, uh, uh, which is that uh, uh, based on that statement, we can use the starting from J1, J2 type of uh, uh, underlying uh, interactions of the, uh, of the IO uh, quasi-local moments uh, living on the square lattice. And uh, so we divide that into A and B sub lattices and uh, write down effective theory based on the staggered component of each sub lattices and the building the uh, effect of the coherent uh, electron weights. And that led to uh, the uh, consideration of anti pi zero anti fellow magnetic order. The uh, dashed line here is the outset of the pneumatic order. And uh, the zero temperature transition for two dimensions is weakly first order because this is marginally relevant. In three dimensions, uh, it would be continuous that follows from just the uh, uh, counting of the scaling dimension of this uh, uh, coupling. And, uh, but in both cases, they will be uh, concurrent. 
and we verify that statement later on uh, from some large end calculations of this uh, effective fear theory. Now, uh, uh, that uh, 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 cannot be the end of the story because we want to couple these uh, collective effects with the electron physics. Uh, but there's also uh, a question uh, which I alluded to last time. If you look at the nictites, uh, if you look at uh, the calcogenites and the weight of FETE, for instance, the ordered component is already signifying that uh, it's larger than the uh, spin one uh, object. Uh, but here, the total spectral weight is uh, uh, three Bohr magneton square per ion, which is very large. It corresponds to a whole size of uh, spin one half living at uh, every site, if you just count uh, the, the weight. And uh, uh, that's what the neutron tells us, neutron scattering experiments. And uh, uh, so presumably that's a lower bound of the spectral weight. But it also says that there's, uh, uh, if I want to start from spin one, uh, there's a uh, a lot of uh, spectral weight that has been shaking into some uh, background. Uh, so we would like to look at this problem from electronic models. Uh, it's uh, uh, among the various reasons uh, for uh, doing so. And so we've uh, uh, recently, and this is the uh, work primarily of uh, Wen Jun uh, Hu and uh, uh, Lei Chen in collaboration with uh, uh, Federica Becker, uh, we've uh, considered the multi-orbital Hubble model uh, with uh, Hong's interactions, and it's been recognized, uh, everybody agrees that Hong's interaction uh, is an important part of the correlation physics. And so we would like to study uh, the uh, ground state uh, using variational Monte Carlo. Uh, and the reason is that in the intermediate correlation regime where the system is on the verge of uh, Electron localization or delocalization, uh, it's a challenge uh, for uh, uh, to, to theoretically access that region. And the variation on the color is one of uh, uh, the ways uh, to do so, uh, and which is based on some trial wave function uh, that uh, 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 is uh, uh, attached with uh, uh, gestural factors. And one of the things we did that uh, uh, plan knowledge has not been done in the past uh, was to recognize that the Hong's uh, coupling uh, is uh, important for the correlation physics. Uh, so we would like not only uh, use the usual density uh, gestural factor, but also the spin uh, gestural factor that can treat uh, the Hong's coupling. Uh, so we've uh, uh, used this uh, uh, method uh, for uh, some two orbital version uh, of the models for of the multi orbital Hubble models by for the ion nictites uh, introduced by Sri Raghu and the collaborators from very early on, as well as some three orbital uh, version of the model introduced by uh, uh, Adriana uh, Morillo and uh, collaborators. And uh, in both cases, uh, we were able to study, ask the following question, uh, two questions. First, uh, what kind of order uh, is stabilized? And uh, what I'm showing here is that uh, the final statement that there's a, a pi zero anti fellow magnetic order uh, evolving as a function of u. This is a, a two orbital model and the bandwidth is somewhere uh, around, around here. And, uh, uh, and this is a pneumatic order uh, the order parameter, which I already defined last time, uh, the product of spins along the x direction uh, minus uh, the product along the y direction. And uh, we can show uh, by doing calculations of different sizes, L by L uh, clusters, in using this uh, relational Monte Carlo method, to show that indeed uh, both orders uh, uh, within numerical uncertainty uh, go. Uh, are suppressed uh, concurrently. And so this is the uh, result uh, based on the finite size scaling to the thermodynamic limit. And uh, these uh, uh, represents the critical values uh, of, uh, for the transition and within the numerical uh, uncertainty, they are the same. And within the numerical uncertainty, this is compatible with uh, second order phase transition, although we cannot exclude the tiny uh, Jump of the order parameter uh, between the two points uh, here. So, so all these uh, 
are consistent uh, with uh, the conclusions from effective field theory, but uh, obviously this uh, uh, is done on uh, the electronic model. And uh, uh, we can see the effect of Hohn's uh, uh, coupling. Uh, and uh, uh, we can also connect it uh, to uh, the uh, localization, delocalization transition, which uh, one can, in this procedure, can infer by two things. One is to calculate the density uh, structure factor, N of Q, and ask uh, what's the behavior of, uh, of N of Q in the small Q uh, limit. And uh, the other is uh, analyze the double on density versus uh, the interaction. And uh, uh, the combination of these two uh, lead us to conclude that the uh, localization delocalization transition is somewhere around here uh, above uh, at a value of u that's larger than uh, both the anti fellow magnetic uh, quantum critical point and a pneumatic uh, quantum critical point, but not that far away. So, so therefore, the, uh, the quantum critical point uh, or points uh, that are concurrent uh, happen uh, in the bad metal uh, regime. We haven't uh, been able to calculate the quasi particle weight uh, Z versus U in this approach. It can be done. It takes uh, uh, more work to do that. So the expectation based on the statement uh, of, uh, for that follows from analyzing the density structure factor and double on density evolution is that the Z uh, is still small uh, at the point where the transition uh, takes place. So. Uh, so, uh, so this uh, provides an electronic way of, first of all, seeing uh, the pneumatic order uh, that uh, accompanies the uh, magnetic order uh, and uh, uh, that agrees with the, uh, the conclusion of analyzing effective field theory from scaling analysis from large M uh, calculations. Uh, uh, but it also sets a stage of uh, analyzing the couplings of electrons to this uh, collective uh, objects. Uh, and so uh, at least I'm quite excited that this direction uh, should allow uh, further studies uh, uh, that uh, 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 regarding the coupling of the uh, uh, collective, uh, uh, the orders uh, uh, with uh, the uh, underlying electronic uh, excitations. So this is about uh, nictites. The nictites is uh, uh, the asimites, uh, the canonical case of pi zero uh, collinear anti fellow magnetic order and uh, this pneumatic order that accompanies it. One of the, uh, the uh, surprising and also rich uh, uh, behavior that the overall family of the ion based uh, uh, superconductors uh, has uh, uh, is that uh, this. Uh, uh, very large, uh, there's a diversity of electronic orders. And, uh, uh, and uh, presumably that even though pneumaticity almost always accompanies uh, such electronic orders, the diversity of electronic orders would suggest that microscopically there's some uh, diversity with the pneumatic order, uh, the underlying degree freedom that uh, uh, comes in forming the uh, uh, pneumatic uh, correlations in pneumatic order even though on symmetry grounds, uh, most of them uh, look the same. And uh, so given this diversity of electronic orders, uh, again, one could uh, uh, just like uh, the large material, materials parameter space of these systems, one could uh, consider these as complications, but one could also consider these as uh, an opportunity and ask the, the question whether there's uh, a, a unified way uh, to understand uh, these different types of uh, electronic orders. And that's the effort uh, that I want to uh, describe, uh, which is uh, uh, going towards unification. So perhaps the most famous uh, story in this variety of electronic orders is the FESE. This uh, is a material that was uh, already looked at uh, a couple of years after the initial discovery of the ion-based superconductors, but uh, the attention to it was really uh, revised, uh, revived uh, by the Oxford group and the, uh, 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 the council group and the Dresden group, uh, among uh, others. And uh, the, uh, what was emphasized 
was that if you look at the ambient pressure uh, phase transition, uh, there is tetragonal to orthorhombic phase transition around 90 Kelvin, just like there was uh, in the uh, one to two arsenides here, it's somewhere around 140 or so Kelvin. So the temperature scales is similar, uh, but there's no static anti magnetic order. If you do uh, elastic neutral scattering, uh, one doesn't see anything. And so uh, what, what does that mean? And then there's a rich phase diagram here, which I'm going to come back to. And so what uh, uh, in the effort uh, to uh, gain a unified understanding, uh, we started, uh, this was a work primarily done with Wang Yu initially, uh, but has continued on, uh, as I will describe, uh, which was that uh, for the uh, ion uh, arsenides already, uh, I describe uh, if one uh, chooses uh, to start from this quasi localized moment at zero sort of physics with J1, J2, that's not adequate. Uh, one uh, would need to include the biquadratic couplings to understand uh, the dynamics. And uh, uh, these are multi orbital systems. So there's a good reason that uh, they should be uh, present, although uh, why uh, uh, and how big that is, I purely we don't know. Uh, there's a large effort of using ab initial methods to calculate uh, uh, J uh, in these systems. But the initial method is very hard to be applied uh, to extract the biquadratic coupling because initial methods uses the single particle uh, properties and uh, uh, the dipolar sector couples to single particle uh, degrees freedom very well. Uh, the uh, uh, the uh, quadrupolar uh, sector uh, does not couple to the uh, electronic uh, uh, single particle degree freedom very well. And uh, so that uh, makes it uh, uh, hard to really know uh, the uh, initial values of K. So I'm going to ask the following question. Let's assume that there is a, a frustrating uh, uh, bilinear exchange interactions, but also uh, the presence of these uh, biquadratic interactions and, and ask, uh, is there some reasonable robust uh, understanding of the phase diagram that can give rise to a variety of phases. Uh, we uh, already described the phases that describe uh, uh, that are uh, uh, consistent with the properties of ion arsenides. Is there a phase in the phase diagram that can be consistent with the property of the FESE uh, uh, and, and others? And I'll come back to the others. So the uh, proposal was uh, that. Uh, uh, if uh, there's a spin quadrupolar uh, order, uh, quadrupoles being the product uh, of the spins, uh, you can think of it as a disk uh, in the spin space. And, uh, uh, and if uh, these objects form a pi zero uh, uh, order, uh, uh, and default quadrupolar order, and I'll pick one to do the analysis, uh, that uh, uh, should uh, satisfy uh, the phenomenological constraint that there's no uh, magnetic sig if, uh, signal that can be seen, uh, but there's a nematicity. And uh, uh, we can uh, go through order from uh, disorder analysis in, in semi-classical analysis or, uh, uh, or you know, in, in the, for, for the spin one system, uh, initially for the classical spin limit as well, and uh, I'll describe some efforts of using DMRG to show that such a phase does exist and is stable. Uh, and uh, uh, we uh, uh, calculate, uh, this was actually done before the experiment, uh, calculated the spin spectral weight uh, distribution as a function of Q and omega. Uh, so at the low frequency limit, one can see uh, that the matrix element uh, zero frequency, there's no coupling uh, to the spin structure factor. Uh, spin structure factor will not pick it up. Uh, finite frequency, uh, there is a, a, a matrix element uh, which is linearly proportional to E, and so uh, E square, uh, and then in the coastal mode, which is the, in the quadrupolar sector, uh, has a spectral weight of one over E, 
So we expect the linear in E uh, spectral weight at low energies. And, but importantly, there's the both uh, spectral weight near pi zero. Uh, and that's the proposed wave vector uh, for the quadrupolar order. And uh, uh, th there's also spectral wave uh, pi pi. So this uh, uh, was uh, subsequently uh, seen uh, in the inelastic neutral scattered experiment. There is this sizable spectral weight uh, near pi zero, uh, but there's a, uh, if one uh, look at in detail, in system linear in E dependence, that's compatible with the, the data, but uh, uh, one probably, uh, this is not the best linear E dependence, uh, and, uh, but it's, it's at least compatible. And there's a both that and, uh, uh, and the pi pi spectral weight. And the two have, uh, uh, its own temperature dependence. If you look at the temperature dependence near pi zero, uh, it looks like all set up in an order parameter like way as temperatures uh, uh, is an order through uh, the 90 Kelvin, the structural uh, phase transition. So, uh, so these, uh, at least the uh, inelastic neutral scattering measurement is uh, compatible with the pi zero and the uh, quadrupolar order. Ultimately, it's a hidden order. It's really very hard to directly uh, probe it. Uh, and uh, uh, so right now the dynamical measurement is the, uh, and also the temperature dependence of the finite frequency uh, spectral weight uh, is the uh, most direct uh, the consistency check. Uh, there's also uh, uh, something that's worth emphasizing. I mentioned that IO uh, nictides uh, where anti ferromagnetic order is seen, the total spectral weight is about three Bohr magnetol square per IO. And this is a huge amount of spectral weight. Uh, it's even larger than the IO arsenide case, uh, even though uh, there's no uh, static uh, magnetic order. Um, I already mentioned that uh, there's a very interesting phase diagram uh, as a function uh, I already alluded to as a function of pressure. Uh, so, with that in mind, uh, we've uh, carried out uh, a, a DMRG study uh, of uh, uh, this model, this uh, uh, J and K uh, model uh, that uh, uh, goes along uh, with some uh, 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 semi-classical analysis based on uh, site factorized wave functions uh, for uh, uh, based on the SU3 representation. Uh, and the, uh, the semi-classical calculation uh, led to, for, for these various choices of parameters, uh, led to a, a statement that uh, the, uh, the, uh, the pi zero anti quadrupolar order sits in the phase diagram in a robust way adjacent to the pi zero collinear anti magnetic order, either directly uh, adjacent to each other or separated by a phase that has wave vector of uh, uh, pi half pi, and uh, there's uh, uh, and that's anti ferromagnetic And so uh, based on the uh, patterns of order, one would conclude that all these three phases are pneumatic, and we can calculate the pneumatic order parameters uh, combination of sigma one, which is the usual pneumatic order based on the product of spins, and uh, uh, the sigma q, uh, which is based on the product of the quadrupolar moment. Uh, again, product uh, along X bound minus its counterpart along Y bound. And uh, so, so the two components evolved. So J1, J2 over J1, 1.5 is a taken cut like this. And J2 over J1 equals 0 0.8 uh, is taking a cut through this. And uh, so the important point is that all these phases are pneumatic. Uh, which we can see from the DMRG calculation. And also DMRG, uh, we've done some representative data points uh, in this plant uh, space to, to verify uh, such uh, uh, order. Uh, and uh, so, so this is the effort. This uh, uh, DMRG is an expensive calculation. We've done on L times 2L uh, uh, strip and uh, uh, analyzing these uh, uh, correlators. Uh, on uh, interior L by L uh, portion 
of that strip. And uh, uh, but the, the the upshot of this is that with that understanding of the phase diagram and the fact that they are all pneumatic, we can make uh, the proposal that uh, uh, applying pressure is, uh, and there are, there are several reasons that uh, we can think of applying pressure as, uh, 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 as uh, 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 causing a decrease in the ratio of the uh, bi-quadratic coupling to the bilinear J coupling. Uh, so this will be going to the left and that uh, would, uh, that led us to propose that under pressure in FESE, uh, one is going from uh, this uh, uh, antiferro quadrupolar order phase to the pi zero antiferro magnet order. And maybe there's a region in between. And there's uh, quite a bit of uh, uh, studies of the phase diagram and the electronic orders under pressure uh, by the uh, AIMS group, uh, by the Beijing group, and by others. Uh, there's also quite a bit of uh, uh, thermosurface measurements uh, uh, as a function of pressure. And uh, uh, I don't think everybody agrees on the phase diagram, all the details, but the uh, overall feature uh, is that uh, there's a, a, a pneumatic order at ambient pressure without dipolar magnetic order, but eventually the dipolar magnetic order develops and appears to be pneumatic. And uh, eventually 38 Kelvin superconductivity uh, appears at the high uh, uh, at high pressures. And perhaps there's an intermediate independent phase, perhaps not, this is still to be sorted out. So at least uh, this uh, uh, allows us, this J and K type model allows us to provide an understanding of such uh, uh, types of phases and phase transitions. Uh, I also want to, I don't have the time to go through all of these, but uh, there's uh, FETE has its own type of anti magnetic order, and it's also pneumatic. Uh, there are certain IO asymites, which show double Q C4 symmetric uh, anti magnetic order. And uh, recently, there's a uh, development of this uh, N equals 5.5, this potassium, cesium, rubidium, IO2 arsenic 2, uh, which is heavily hold up side of the uh, arsenide phase diagram, which showed a B2G pneumatic order, which I want to uh, briefly go through. Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, the initial uh, uh, experiment actually came from, uh, which I'm, I, I, I'm not uh, referring to that here, there was an initial NMR measurement by the USTC group, uh, which suggested that in these systems, uh, the, uh, there's a, an isotropy uh, that's uh, 45 degrees away from the usual anisotropy uh, that is seen in the uh, barrier ion to arsenic two. Uh, the Fodan group uh, did the STM measurement and provide added evidence for the rotated form of pneumaticity. And then uh, the uh, uh, Tokyo uh, cultural collaboration uh, show that elasto pneumaticity uh, of uh, cesium ion to arsenic 2 uh, as, as well as rubidium ion to arsenic 2 has the largest uh, uh, susceptibility along the direction which is 45 degree rotated and that's compatible with uh, the STM conclusion uh, and the NMR conclusion. Uh, I should uh, caution that very recently in a Bomer, so I guess a, a second uh, a cultural group uh, has uh, uh, raised objections to uh, to this, uh, so I think experimentally it still needs to uh, be sorted out. But nonetheless, it uh, at least motivated us to think about uh, these different forms of uh, pneumatic orders. And so usually when think about C4 symmetry breaking as characterizing the pneumatic order, we claim that in fact, the more general form is uh, to to have a, a discrete symmetry breaking that in fact is more convenient to, uh, to be organized in terms of broken uh, mirror symmetry. And so B1G is the usual case where X and Y uh, represents the two principal uh, directions. Uh, there's a B2G, uh, which is a 45 degree rotated. And then there's also 
uh, A to G, uh, all these are one dimensional representations of D4H point group. And in fact, last time there was a question, uh, a week ago in my talk, there was a question about whether there could be uh, pneumatic order uh, in, uh, in uh, the case when it's tetragonal. So, uh, so I, I, I answered that there's a lot of uh, uh, fluctuations that certainly is seen in the tetragonal part of phase diagram. But in, in fact, an A to G pneumatic order would be in that category. It respects the C4 symmetry, but it breaks uh, two uh, mirror symmetry. So it's still uh, a pneumatic order. And to my knowledge, there has been no observation indication of A to G order, uh, pneumatic order, but B to G is in principle uh, uh, allowed. And one can connect that to the type of, if it's a spin driven pneumatic uh, order, one could tie it up with the, the type of uh, uh, magnetic fluctuations, uh, which I did not get into. But let me just uh, mention that there's also a reasonably sound uh, empirical basis to think about B2G pneumatic order in the uh, uh, heavily hodo uh, ion arsenides. This is a neutral scattering measurement uh, in potassium ion to uh, arsenic to, which show that there's a very large spectral weight at two pi over three, uh, two pi over three uh, wave vector. Uh, so two pi over three, two pi over three wave vector would correspond a pattern like this. And uh, according to our classification, it would be of the B2G uh, pneumatic order that, that can be promoted by it. We did some microscopics to verify that statement. One is uh, at the classical uh, JK spin model level. Uh, uh, where we can use the combinations of J's and K's to identify this QQ and in particular two pi over three, two pi over three type of magnetic order. And if we look at that, we did indeed find the B2G pneumatic order to be developing uh, that's associated with uh, this kind of uh, anti. Here it's a static order uh, in the uh, uh, in reality for uh, for potassium ion to arsenic two. Uh, that's more fluctuation is producing this. Uh, we did a DMRG study uh, for the J and the K combinations that led to this two pi over three, two pi over three uh, order and show that indeed the B2G pneumatic order develops while the B1G is uh, order is uh, negligible and must be zero in thermodynamic limit. And uh, also one could do some lambda analysis to show that if it's really um, a generic incommensurate uh, magnetic fluctuations, it will lead to uh, the three channels of uh, pneumatic correlation B1G, B2G, A2G uh, that the uh, space group symmetry uh, uh, would dictate that has to be uh, degenerate. Uh, and uh, uh, in fact, uh, there's some experimental indication that uh, there's at least a quasi degeneracy between the B1G and the B2G channel. So that, that's certainly an added wrinkle that's also uh, uh, at least uh, it's interesting and uh, potentially is uh, uh, a useful property uh, for the understanding of the underlying microscopic physics, if not for anything else. And I just want to make uh, uh, the point that I think uh, 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 theoretical and experimental efforts like this is quite important. Uh, and certainly I'd like to see the uh, experimental results to be consistent from different groups. Uh, uh, in that, uh, uh, a few years ago, uh, we looked at uh, this system uh, in collaboration with Hilbert von Ronais and uh, Kai Gruber, and uh, uh, to suggest that uh, indeed, uh, the, uh, the electronic orders at in the vicinity of N equals 5.5, and there's in fact a uh, quantum critic indication for quantum criticality, that order is different from this pi zero and the fellow magnetic order that is typically uh, seen. Uh, so efforts like this, uh, pneumatic order among other things, uh, 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 spin spectrum and other uh, uh, probes uh, should help eventually to clarify uh, the overall phase diagram and maybe even marching towards uh, the uh, N equals to five case. And so just to, uh, to uh, summarize this uh, part, 
uh, one, uh, perhaps uh, this variety uh, gives the impression that it's very complicated, but I wanna make the claim that all these different kinds of electronic orders seen in different members of ion-based uh, uh, superconductor family and their associated pneumatic orders uh, at least can be, uh, they, they can all appear uh, in the overall phase diagrams of these frustrating J and K type uh, models. And uh, 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 I think uh, this is so far, the, uh, has gone the longest in terms of uh, providing a unified underlying uh, microscopic uh, description. Our tentative conclusion is that uh, uh, these uh, variety of electronic orders and uh, pneumaticity uh, point to the importance of the magnetic interactions and the more generally the key role of the spin channel. That it's not to say that uh, orbitals and other degree freedoms may not be playing a role in uh, the pneumaticity. They must on symmetry grounds. Uh, the question of whether they can be the primary driving force and still understand all this richer variety of electronic orders that uh, to my knowledge has not been looked at. So, so I, 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 I uh, consider uh, this uh, varieties of electronic and, and the pneumatic orders in ion-based uh, uh, materials uh, as uh, an opportunity uh, to uh, 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 in providing clues uh, to the underlying uh, correlation physics. And uh, naturally, if a magnet channel is important uh, and spin uh, degree freedom is important for the electronic orders, uh, they should be thought of as important in driving uh, superconductivity. So I, I will, uh, 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 Pierce, presumably it's more natural if I continue on with the presentation and coming back with the discussion. Uh, You are muted, Pierce, but I take that as a yes. Uh, I said, if there are any questions, please raise your hand at this point. It looks like the audience is quiet, so uh, carry on. Okay, good. Right, so now I'm going to switch gears uh, to uh, the uh, graphene Mori uh, systems, in particular the pneumaticity. We've uh, heard the uh, extensive discussions uh, uh, on these uh, uh, systems, they are very rich. Uh, there's uh, from the very beginning, uh, it was recognized that there's a correlated insulator uh, uh, as part of the phase diagram and there's a super conductivity. And, uh, uh, and so this, uh, uh, the, the twisted bilayer graphing, it was already illustrated that twisting creates uh, this kind of Mori pattern and uh, uh, I'm being blocked by the image, so I need. Okay, good. And uh, uh, the uh, formation of these uh, Mori uh, patterns uh, in uh, uh, for uh, the vicinity of the magic angle gives narrow bands, and uh, these narrow bands uh, can be uh, uh, considered. Uh, to be in terms of uh, uh, a very large uh, unit cell in a real space and a small uh, Brian zone and uh, uh, one associated with uh, one valley and it's uh, a counterpart from the other layer and uh, uh, the other associated with uh, the other valley and its counterpart from the other uh, layer. And so, um, so the question is, uh, let's see. good. Um, uh, so we want to uh, understand uh, the uh, electron correlations and that's uh, one of the uh, central questions uh, uh, in the field. Uh, what's, uh, uh, how do we think about electron correlations in these narrow memory bands? Now, uh, taking some clue uh, from uh, the phenomenology, uh, I want to make two points. First uh, is that, uh, uh, I think I can get back to the laser point. Uh, um, 
Um, that um, uh, the choroid inserter, uh, from the very beginning, uh, it was known that it's quite fragile. So, so this is the very initial set of resistivity versus temperature plot. And you can see that the upturn portion is happening at temperatures below a few Kelvin, in this case, four Kelvin and different samples give you uh, different uh, uh, precise values, but uh, several Kelvin, maybe up to 10 Kelvin, but that's a scale. And uh, this is also shown here as a conductance versus one over T that in this initial set of for samples, inserting behavior happens below four Kelvin uh, and only below uh, in this temperature range. Right. And so what's the scale? In the nictites, uh, ion based superconductors, I uh, emphasized last time that we have a hierarchy of scales. We have electron volts for electron correlation scale. We have 100 milli electron volts for electronic order and the fluctuation scale. And we have 10 MeV for uh, the CPU conductivity gap, et cetera, scale. Here, uh, the scale is much reduced. It's more like heavy fermion scale. Uh, the bandwidth uh, in practice is on the order of 10 uh, to 20 MeV. Uh, and, uh, uh, but even compared to that small energy scale, uh, the regime that the CPU inserting behavior happens, uh, it's uh, at least uh, one decade of uh, scale uh, below. Uh, so, uh, so that uh, suggests that the choroid inserter, uh, it's an inserter, but it's a very fragile uh, inserter. Good, that's point number one. Uh, point number two, and that's very recent, uh, uh, namely, there's a, a, a number of STM groups which have uh, probed uh, the electronic states in the bilayer, uh, twisted bilayer graph thing. And uh, I uh, am showing you uh, the result of uh, Abe uh, uh, Paspati's group from Colombia, uh, which I thought was uh, uh, at least especially informative to me, uh, in which they, they just uh, traced the uh, local denser states in real space. They just rotate 120 degrees and rotate another 120 degrees and uh, 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 construct the difference in the local density states of uh, uh, these uh, different directions and form the absolute value uh, to show that uh, there is this uh, anisotropy. And uh, this anisotropy uh, was found to be energy dependent and uh, uh, is uh, strongest near the Fermi energy. So I, I think that's a, a very appealing feature suggesting that uh, it's an intrinsic property. And also there's some systematics as a function of uh, uh, filling uh, with the anisotropy being the strongest uh, near uh, half filling. So, uh, I don't think the uh, STM experiment can tell us uh, with the presence of local strain, et cetera, uh, that there is actual static order or it's a, uh, just a correlation, but even pneumatic correlation is very interesting. Uh, in the nictides, uh, other bulk materials has taught us a lot about microscopic correlation physics. Uh, and perhaps here it could uh, serve the same purpose. I should mention that transport measurements uh, have also uh, point to the presence of uh, anisotropy, uh, both in the superconducting and the normal state, uh, but I, I'm going to focus exclusively on the normal state in uh, this work. So um, now uh, the twisted bilayer graphene, uh, we've heard extensive discussions about uh, whether there are a small set of Wannian states uh, that can be used uh, to uh, represent uh, the, the Moray bands uh, or not. Uh, and so, uh, so I want to address uh, these two issues uh, uh, by bypassing that, uh, uh, that issue, that theoretical issue. And uh, uh, the way I bypass that is to look at the uh, trilayer graphing uh, on the uh, hexagonal 
uh, boronitrite. Uh, this uh, uh, is uh, the experiment that's been championed by the Berkeley group uh, in collaboration with the Stanford group. And uh, so the trilayer graphene has been studied since some time ago. This is a side view uh, uh, and it's an ABC stacking. This is a top view uh, of the ABC stacking. And this is a, a view of uh, uh, the couplings. Uh, and uh, uh, now, so that's trilayer graphene per se. And if you put on top of the uh, HBN, the lattice mismatch of about uh, 2% or so uh, implies that there will be a more pattern that will be created. So this is a, just an illustration uh, of, of that. And one can apply a uh, electric field vertically uh, that uh, creates a pot potential bias delta uh, to uh, tune uh, the electronic states of the uh, system. And uh, um, the, uh, uh, it was emphasized that uh, for a particular sign of uh, the electric uh, field uh, that uh, one creates uh, uh, the, uh, the situation in which the Mori band that's sitting near the Fermi energy uh, is uh, in fact uh, uh, has a, a turn number to be zero and uh, 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 you could reverse the sign of the potential and then uh, that's no longer the case. Uh, so I learned that uh, band uh, structure and uh, the underlying microscopy model from uh, Sento uh, who said <clears throat> that, hey, this is the case where uh, there are, uh, there's a two orbital uh, Hubbard model uh, and uh, so the, with the uh, potential that I've chosen here, uh, this is the uh, bands, uh, the red and the uh, uh, blue uh, the, uh, represent the two, uh, two valleys, uh, which uh, uh, is the orbital degrees freedom. So that's the two orbital. Uh, and it is the uh, Hubble model part, uh, you have the dispersion uh, that uh, with finite number of pi binding parameters, uh, one can capture that, both the bands and the Fermi surface. And uh, as the usual uh, Hubbard and Hong's coupling on site, but obviously because the, uh, I don't know, obviously, but uh, the, the, uh, the unit cell being so large, uh, one should also consider uh, inter-site interactions. And uh, so V is the uh, nearest neighbor density density interaction, VH is the, a nearest neighbor uh, exchange interaction. And uh, uh, the, the work of uh, uh, Zhang and Santo, in fact, provides some uh, estimate of uh, what uh, uh, these uh, uh, parameters could be. Question to well, you. Yes, please. Uh, a few questions. Um, uh, can you tell, what can you tell us about your band structure that you used here? Um, are these, uh, Orbitals, Vanier states uh, locate localized on the honeycomb lattice, or, or on the triangular lattice. On the triangular lattice. Yeah. So this is a pattern which I'm showing you, and yes. I can define nearest neighbor hopping, uh, next nearest neighbor hopping, etc. Uh, it's not. It's only a very limited number of the hopping parameters. I see. So exactly. because some of the approaches take Vanier states that are on the that are localized on the uh, honeycomb. Sites. So here is a triangle. Okay. Does that make a difference in the results one gets? It it uh, it, it could uh, certainly for the electronic orders. We've uh, basically focused our analysis. This is a very first piece of work on the Mori systems uh, on this uh, 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 it, uh, on this model, which uh, is well defined on the triangular lattice. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Oh, could I maybe add one thing? Yeah, Sento, please. Yeah, so yes, uh, you may be recalling the story of twisted bilayer graphene, which has an extra C2 symmetry, which is absent in this system. Mm -hmm. So I given that that symmetry is broken, you know, the honeycomb description is no advantage to that. Okay. Uh, that's all. Yeah. Pierce, are you happy with that? Yeah, I'm happy. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, so uh, so we've uh, 
uh, started with this model and uh, we've done two things. Uh, as I said, the fragility of uh, the core inserting phase uh, was uh, something that uh, uh, was in my mind when I first saw uh, these uh, uh, data uh, from the very beginning. Uh, didn't do anything with it, uh, 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 but with this model, uh, we decided to look at that. So we've uh, applied this uh, U1 auxiliary spin method, which I described last time. If there's a question, I'll be very happy to show uh, the representation again, but uh, it was presented uh, a week ago in my talk. And it's the same method. And so we've uh, looked at this model, two orbital Hubble model. Um, first at half filling. So the blue line uh, shows uh, Z, the quasi-particle weight, uh, as a function of U over W. And you can see that there's a, a metal to insulator transition. Uh, if we introduce uh, the, so this so far, first look at the outside interactions, the Holtz coupling, uh, uh, the Holtz coupling reduces the threshold of value for the uh, uh, metal to insert the transition. And in fact, with reasonable values on its coupling, you can see that the effect is quite pronounced. And with reasonable value of the on its coupling, uh, one, uh, the parameters which were estimated uh, for, this, uh, 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 for this system would be sitting sort of uh, either on the bad metal side or on the fragile insulator side. So by fragile insulator, I mean, uh, just like bad metal, I mean the metallic ground state, but the quasi-particle weight has been substantially reduced from the non-interacting value. Fragile insulator is defined as being on the localized side, but uh, it's still not too far away uh, from the localization, uh, delocalization transition. Uh, we've uh, done very limited amount of work for the quarter filling case uh, for both zero and uh, non-zero Holmes coupling. And the systematics are compatible with everything we know about for the orbital Hubbard models. Uh, but I'm going to focus on the uh, half fitting case. And with this as a guidance, I'm going to now look at uh, the electronic order. And uh, uh, so we've uh, done so using the variation of Monte Carlo uh, method that I described earlier, that also used the spin gesture factor, giving that, recognizing that holds coupling. Uh, plays a very important role. And so, uh, so first, just outside interactions, uh, what we found that, uh, that uh, is that, uh, there could be, for instance, the candidate orders would be the collinear anti-fellow magnetic order uh, that with a pattern shown here. There could be uniaxial anti-fellow uh, valley order uh, with a pattern, uh, valley pattern shown uh, here, we found that uh, uh, among the various states we have considered, this collinear anti fellow magnetic order has the uh, uh, lowest energy for this uh, particular choice of uh, U over W, which is sitting uh, somewhere around here in within this sort of cluster region uh, as a function of the uh, Holtz coupling. And uh, so the important point to make here is that as I go through the metal to insulator transition boundary, regardless whether I'm on the bad metal side or whether I'm on the fragile insulator side, uh, the uh, effect on the uh, uh, magnetic order, electronic order is uh, very minimal. The, basically, it's the same uh, collinear anti fellow magnetic order uh, that's stabilized. And we can do the same thing by fixing the Holmes coupling to a particular value and uh, tune you uh, to the metal to insert a transition. Once again, whether I'm on the bad metal side or fragile insert side, the magnetic order is, uh, uh, doesn't really notice that. With that, we can calculate the pneumatic order. This, uh, the model actually has a, a C6 uh, uh, symmetry uh, because the, uh, the uh, interactions uh, uh, that broke the C6 symmetry is considered to be uh, small, but uh, in, in, uh, if you, uh, uh, the actual symmetry is C3, but that doesn't matter. 
uh, in either of the two cases, we would be led uh, to consider uh, this nematic order parameter, which uh, is defined by the products of the E1, E2, E3 directions and forming this uh, combination. So uh, in, according to uh, D6, this would be uh, one of the uh, two dimensional representations according to uh, D3 it will be uh, just a one dimensional representation. And uh, so we can uh, calculate the pneumatic order parameter using the variation of Monte Carlo. And we found that uh, uh, the, there is a, a pneumatic order uh, which is present both on the fragile insulator side of the uh, localization, delocalization transition, uh, as well as on the uh, bad metal side of the localization, delocalization transition. And we, we reach the same conclusion regardless of whether we fix the U tune Holmes coupling or fix the Holmes coupling uh, tuning uh, U. So uh, this uh, 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 one more thing I should present uh, as, as I emphasized that the, uh, the nearest neighbor interactions uh, can play an important role. And we want to ask whether uh, these uh, orders are stable against uh, such interactions. So uh, VH, is the exchange interaction uh, nearest neighbor. And we found that there's a finite range uh, of stability uh, before the ferromagnet with green is the ferromagnetic order and eventually uh, becomes the, the ground state. And the, again, the estimated using the uh, cooling in interaction form and project to these states, that's the value is somewhere around here. Uh, so, so at least uh, it could still be uh, uh, falling in the regime uh, that uh, uh, the, the this the collinear and development in order is stable and there's a pneumatic order. And uh, in any case, the main conclusion to us is that there's a reasonably a finite range of stability of such a state, but there are also competing states floating around. And we also look at the stability against the uh, the nearest neighbor uh, repulsive uh, interaction, the, the V term. And there's a sizable range of stability. The estimated value of V is somewhere uh, around uh, here. And it's still in the region where uh, it's at least uh, lower in energy than the uh, null order state. Uh, that E0 is a null ordered, uh, the energy, ground state energy of null order state. And CAFM is the collinear anti ferromagnet order that I presented. So, so this leads me to the end of this part. Uh, by looking at how pneumatic order could arise in uh, this system, uh, we reach uh, the conclusion that uh, regardless of whether the parent system is a fragile insulator or a bad metal, it doesn't really matter much uh, to the uh, resulting electronic orders and the resulting pneumaticity. And I want to use that as a clue to suggest that the other uh, part of the correlation physics uh, that's anchored by uh, the, uh, the, the parent system, uh, it really doesn't care that much whether the system uh, in the uh, integer filling, nearby integer filling is on the fragile insulator side um, or the bad metal side. Uh, they, uh, all of these have a range uh, uh, that anchors uh, a domain of attraction uh, in which uh, uh, the correlation that one sees uh, that uh, in the parent system can still influence even in the, in the uh, away from the integer filling. So, uh, so I want to make that uh, as the uh, proposition that uh, the the kind of things that were discussed earlier in the week that uh, there's superconductivity regardless of the fate. Uh, of the uh, correlated insulator, looking at this perspective uh, is uh, would be natural because whether the integer filling is sitting here or you tune the strength of interactions and turn the integer filling state to the bad metal side, the physics uh, away from integer filling uh, uh, largely uh, wouldn't care too much. So just like in a nick tight, the parent system is bad metal, can still control the correlation physics. Uh, here, 
uh, it's exciting that the fragile insider is seen. And it's exciting that the integer filling can be tuned across it. And one could ask question whether the overall correlation physics including simple conductivity uh, is much modified or not. And so far, evidence suggests uh, that uh, uh, they are not. And in fact, to me, that's not a contradiction for the, uh, the correlation driven uh, electro, electro interaction driven CP conductivity. In fact, I would say that actually uh, elevates uh, the uh, contention that the CP conductivity is driven by primary driven by electron electron correlation as opposed to electron format driven. So, with that, uh, let me summarize. For the ion nictites and the calcogenites, I emphasize on diverse electronic orders and diverse uh, uh, and associated nematicity post a, a, a went through the effort in which we advanced a unified understanding based on frustration uh, and uh, the uh, rich phase diagram that uh, comes from that. And uh, uh, the overall conclusion uh, from this looking at the electronic orders is that a bad metallicity uh, yields uh, short range spin couplings. And that coupled with the things that I went through last time is that the, that it's a spin interaction that involves multiple orbitals and that that would be uh, uh, driving uh, or the primary driving force uh, for uh, physics such as superconductivity. Uh, for the Mori systems, uh, I described a, uh, a setting uh, in which uh, we can uh, consider the role of fragile insulator, which is a big part uh, of, of I, what I want to term as the core the insulator that's still seen in these systems, as well as the accompanying bad uh, metallic state of the parent system uh, for uh, their role uh, on the uh, pneumatic correlations, which uh, have uh, just been seen uh, in the initial batch of experiments. Uh, and uh, there presumably will be more that will be forthcoming. Uh, and also, uh, uh, and I want to use the pneumatic order as a proxy of uh, the low energy physics uh, 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 that uh, comes with the uh, in the systems and uh, uh, and to me the uh, uh, persistence of superconductivity when you drive uh, the uh, parents the integer filling phase out of the fragile insert into the bad metal phase is in fact uh, a uh, reinforcement of uh, the notion that uh, it is uh, electron correlations which primarily is driving. Uh, super connected. Thank you. Let's thank Kimia. Uh, okay, a lot of, lot of uh, great material. Um, let's uh, start with a few questions. Yasha, you have a question. Uh, yes, so I, I mean, uh, about this last point, um, uh, I guess, uh, I guess uh, the distinction in my mind was that uh, if a system uh, becomes a mott insulator at half filling, uh, then this is a strong correlate, a strong, uh, uh, strongly correlated system. Otherwise, it's a weakly correlated system. But no, the point that you raise is that it could be that it doesn't become insulator, but it's a still a strongly correlated system. So can you please explain? Yeah. So, so usually when we see uh, a correlated insulator in a phase diagram, we connect it to the cooperated physics, which uh, uh, in which uh, uh, you know would be uh, presumably would be somewhere around here, uh, where the insulating state is already very well established. Uh, the right. what I want to contend is that the insulating phase that's been seen in these Mori systems is very fragile, which means that yes, it's on the localized side, but it really is not too far away from the Mar transition. And if I just uh, tune the correlation stress by relatively small amount, I don't know, uh, say 10% in this dimensionless measure, I can already go to the bad metal side. But it's a bad metal, it's uh, not, so neither uh, in this terminology, neither is strongly correlated, both are intermediately correlated. And both uh, are sitting in the vicinity of the localization, delocalization transition, just that uh, 
uh, one is uh, on one side and the other is on the other side. Uh, can you also explain what would be a Hund's axis uh, do on this diagram? If I had a third axis of Hund's interaction, like a local Hund's interaction. Yeah, so, um, you know, in more the orbital systems, I, I talked about such a, a two axis a phase diagram last time for the, in the context of nictides. And that leads to uh, when you have, when you break the orbital degeneracy, you get, you end up with orbital selectivity. But otherwise, uh, what uh, if uh, in a system like this particular one that I talked about, the, there's orbital degeneracy. And uh, what the Hund's coupling does is to uh, lower the threshold interaction for the localization, delocalization transition. Uh, whether it uh, retains, wh whether it changes the order of transition from uh, uh, one to another, that's a harder question. I've, uh, worked, right, right, right. We've yeah, worked sure. pretty hard. Uh, but it to, favors uh, insulator. It, it favors, ins it, it favors in insulating. Yes. yes, correct. Thank you. And, and in fact, uh, that was one point I made that this curve corresponds to, uh, and I should stress, this is really the hard work of Leitcher and Hao Yu Hu. Um, that the, this is the Hund's coupling equal to zero. Yes. The threshold value is here. And that if I switch on Hund's coupling, for instance, this ratio of 3%, uh, so the, the boundary has already been shifted sizable. So it um, uh, makes uh, the, the threshold for localization to be reduced, threshold interaction. Okay. Um... Any other questions here? Central has a question. Central, we can't hear you. Oh, great. Yeah. If you can. Um, Good. So the uh, the order that you had is uh, the collinear antiferromagnet, and uh, did I understand correctly that it persists into the metallic state? Yeah. Uh, so that would. Uh, that presumably can be uh, addressed in experiment by looking at Shubnikov de Haas oscillations in the metallic state. Yeah, so that's see... uh, or, or even uh, in these systems uh, that they have realized recently, one could also uh, ask whether there's anisotropy. Yeah, so the anisotropy is a bit harder to measure in the normal state. Right? Uh, uh, so, what do you mean? Because, like that? oh, uh, you know, the, the transport experiments uh, to detect anisotropy, what they have to do is to look at uh, Rxy minus Ryx, you know, that's symmetric in a field. Yeah. So, it's, it's, uh, it's a bit subtle to extract. That. Well, I was thinking more of this STM. Right? Um, oh, STM is, you know, for the system you talked about, given that it's, uh, it needs dual gates, right? So to apply the displacement field, it you may be hard that, to turn them in. in the ABC trilayer. No, no, no those I, 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 I'm sort of using the ABC trilayer as, uh, as, as a setting where, you know, uh, some concrete calculations can be done. But I'm suggesting that even mm. in this just the bilayer case, where uh, I think there were several protocols which were, have been used to reduce the interaction and mm -hmm. kill the uh, insulating phase. Yeah. I'm suggesting that uh, for integer filling, especially the metallic state, uh, something like this measuring the anisotropy in a local density of states uh, would be mm. extremely instructive to see whether, because I, sure. I have yeah. the feeling that that the band folding associated with um, magnetic order, it would be wonderful to see that, uh, but probably is harder than, mm. uh, than the, 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 the anisotropy uh, in this STM type of measurement. Yeah, it'd be great to do STM on the screen devices. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 yeah, and just Definitely. just to see where the features, how the features evolve mm -hmm. as you go through uh, this tuning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that would be wonderful. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks. 
Okay, we have a question here from um, uh, uh, Matthew Watson. Matthew, do you want to ask it yourself or shall I read it out? No response there. I'll read it out then. Matthew Watson says, on the first half of the talk, the term pneumatic originally came as an analogy for e.g. orthorhombic phase of barium 122s because rotational symmetry is broken. However, your AFQ order for iron selenide breaks translation, and later you described pneumatic order as rather as breaking mirror symmetries rather than rotation, and even had a pneumatic mode that preserved C4 symmetry. So the question then is, what is your definition of pneumatic now? It seems like you use it for any state without dipolar spin order. Um, a bit tough, but I'm reading it out to you. Well, <laughs> um, so I, I did two things, right? Uh, I think there were several aspects of that question. Uh, in the nd ferro quadrupolar order, uh, yes, it breaks translational symmetry just like ND, pi zero nd ferro magnetic order uh, does. And uh, I'll be very happy if the given where the question came from, I presume the Fermi surface was in mind and I'll be happy to address it, but I think that was not the content of the question. Uh, the definition theoretically is, uh, this was still done, uh, this is still B1G pneumatic order. So, so the uh, symmetry wise, the, what, the pneumatic order that, uh, that's associated with this pi zero nd ferro quadrupolar order Microscopically is different from that uh, that uh, one typically would use for the one two two barium one two two arsenides, but it's exactly the same symmetry. So if you are measuring it, you cannot tell the difference as far as pneumaticity is concerned. So this is just B one G in the language that I use later on. This is the B one G uh, pneumatic order. I in this part, I have said that if I want to capture, for instance, A1, A2G, which also breaks a discrete uh, symmetry, uh, it, I'm better off to use the, uh, this, uh, this uh, broken mirror symmetry formulation. But where they overlap, the B1G and B2G, I, I could just use a C4 symmetry breaking. So um, since A2G, has now been seen. It, it, this, this broken mirror symmetry analysis uh, classification, we found it very useful because uh, it allows us to understand uh, the quasi degeneracy being a robust feature of at least for particular types of magnetic fluctuations. But if you are uh, uh, concerned with the B1G and the B2G pneumaticity, uh, which in the FDSE one certainly is, and even for the uh, cesium ion 2 arsenic 2 phase. Uh, I'm not deviating from the usual definition of pneumatic order. It's a broken C4 signature. So, but I, I'm, I think there may be some other components of questions. So maybe <laughs> if uh, there's a follow up. Any more questions? Let me just see. Uh, I have one. Good. Yeah. Here's uh, Simiao. Uh, yes. As far as I understood, um, you actually relate the uh, pneumaticity to the biquadratic exchange. Mm -hmm. And the question then arises whether, um, for instance, an iron selenide, um, where you don't have magnetic order, where does the um, uh, pneumaticity arise from? Yeah, so, so the scenario that we propose is that, uh, that this overall Hamiltonian that contains the usual J1, J2 type interactions and the biquadratic interactions, uh, it's uh, there's enough of the competition from these different terms in interaction that, uh, that it has a rich phase diagram. In this phase diagram, uh, there's uh, such a phase which uh, is made up of these uh, spin quadrupolar moment, uh, but differentiates between the X and the Y axis. And so this phase cannot be stabilized 
in the absence of the bi-quadratic interaction, but in its presence, and it can compete with uh, J1, J2, uh, this phase uh, competes uh, with uh, the usual pi zero uh, antiferromagnetic type of phase. Uh, and so, so the, the picture here is that uh, even though here I see st static uh, neutral signal for uh, pi zero collinear antiferromagnetic order, here I don't. Uh, the nematicity is the same. And in, that's in FE, SE, it's the same uh, tetragonal to uh, orthorhombic structural phase transition. That's the proxy of the pneumatic order, just like in barrier one to two. Uh, so, so the 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 um, the, the uh, short answer is that I have the competition between J one and J two, but I also have the competition between J and K. When J ones, I get to the pi zero collinear antiferromagnetic order, mm -hmm. and when K ones uh, in this competition, I get end up with this state, which has all the properties that are compatible with uh, what is seen in FESC. Okay, thank you. But if I understand correctly, then the pneumaticity actually arises from the fluctuation of the spins. And sure. I would then expect that then the J coupling, uh, um, the linear coupling will also be always be stronger than the uh, fluctuations of this, um, um, of the uh, quadratic, um, by quadratic exchange. Uh, yeah, so, uh, so that's the question about where precisely uh, the phase boundary uh, is. And uh, uh, so we can say the following. Um, I, I said uh, two things. One is that uh, I don't have a control of what precisely the microscopic value of K and J is. And I think nobody does either just because uh, Ab initial calculation for K is much harder for ab initial calculations of uh, J's. Uh, but already in the uh, uh, barrier uh, 1 to 2, uh, we looked at the spectrum of the uh, uh, determined by inlast neutral scattering, you know, the dispersing features uh, uh, and the momentum energy distributions of the spin spectral wave. Uh, what, uh, initially, there was a statement from the uh, neutral scattering experimentalists that they have to make uh, J1A to be different from J1B in the tetragonal phase. That doesn't make any sense. Uh, but the, if you have a K term uh, with a, a K over J that's less than one, but you know not uh, that much smaller than one, uh, one can understand the spectrum. So, so I'm saying, so look at this phase diagram. K over J is uh, somewhere around uh, 0.8, et cetera. Uh, that's the, the good enough to reach that, that, that into this uh, uh, quadrupole uh, order, the phase. Yeah, and, uh, and, and I can, uh, so I cannot give you uh, uh, the best answer in terms of values, but I can establish a trend that uh, if I go to uh, better metallicity site like FESC under pressure, uh, then I can, uh, on various theoretical grounds, I can say the K over J is decreasing. Uh, and, and that would be compatible with our proposal that uh, going from FESE to pressurized side, which is closer to the one to two arsenides, one is going from this side to the other side. Thank you. Welcome. Okay, we have a few more questions. Let me ask one from the chat. Uh, Zakia Hossein says, fragile insulator, does it mean the insulating state can be tuned to metallic state easily? That's one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it is that uh, uh, the energy scales associated with this insulating state, such as the gap, the temperature regime that it uh, 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 operates, those temperature scales are much smaller than a natural scale, uh, such as U uh, or the bandwidth. So, so this is a regime where U over W basically is of order unity. 
And uh, uh, one way to define fragile uh, inser inserating state is that the gap and the temperature range where it operates is uh, uh, there's a hierarchy uh, uh, of scale smaller, uh, lower than uh, U or W. Okay. But it's compatible if I'm in, uh, if I have an inserating state, which is closer to the transition rather than here, clearly it's much easier to tune it through uh, uh, the transition onto the metallic side. And that's why I think that the, the recent uh, experiments, why that's so exciting from the perspective of uh, thinking in terms of where uh, the overall system is placed uh, in, in this sort of uh, 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 phase diagram. Okay. okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, let's go back to the uh, raise hands. Uh, we have two still coming up. Uh, the, the next one is from Yasha Komijani. Yasha, you have a question. Yes, I, I, uh, I mean, we know that in this kind of more systems, uh, the interaction is long range, and this can be in principle captured in your slave spin uh, method by using a cluster uh, system. So, so is there a justification for dropping those terms or, or can you comment on it? Yeah, so, so slave spin, uh, I was more using it uh, Look at as a, a guidance uh, of that. Uh, the main focus is really to look at order and, and mimetic. I I'm fascinated by, by the mimetic uh, order or correlation that have been uh, observed. Uh, VMC, uh, it, cluster would be a very natural thing to do, for instance, uh, it's almost like a, the kind of questions that uh, you and I would be both very naturally thinking about in heavy fermions, you have the competition of the RKKY versus condo scale, right? Now here, I think the, the, uh, the, the, uh, there's an issue of generated interactions and, uh, um, and these direct, uh, interaction, in particular, direct exchange interaction, uh, which uh, uh, makes the, the, the question very interesting from uh, all sorts of ways, like for instance, the, makes the strong coupling analysis somewhat more limited than uh, it could, could it be. Uh, but obviously one would like to, uh, to, to do that. And, but, you know, uh, maybe uh, um, if the issue is about um, mimetic order, which is a Q equals zero order, of course, there's no cluster that will be large enough for that. Uh, and uh, uh, so, so in some sense, um, it's not at least obvious that uh, there's a particular, uh, uh, one could anticipate a major change to the, as far as the physics of the order is concerned. Uh, the, uh, if you ask a question like uh, Q dependent, uh, dynamical structure factors, surely, uh, would, as well as uh, properties of uh, single particle momentum dependence. So if, well, the question is along those directions, yes, they would be very, very, very instructive. But I think for the purpose of uh, 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 looking at gross features, such as pneumatic order, it's a Q equals zero order, um, what uh, is done uh, for the uh, outside part uh, is uh, is already uh, uh, very instructive. We've also compared uh, this kind of uh, EMC studies with uh, just good old uh, Hartree self consistent Hartree flock type of calculations, which uh, for twisted binary case has made uh, considerable progress. And then we can see uh, both uh, uh, the reasonableness and the limitations of Hartree flock. Uh, compared to uh, uh, the, these kind of correlated uh, calculations. Okay, let me uh, then invite Gersh to uh, pose his question. Gersh, if you can uh, unmute yourself. Yes. Uh, good to see you, Jimmy. Hi, Gersh. Uh, a question, well, back to the first part of the talk yeah. uh, where you do the classification B1, G, B2, G, B8. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, somehow related to what Matthew Watson asked. Um, 
when it gets to A to G, it doesn't break C4. It breaks, indeed, breaks all mirror symmetries, but it doesn't break the C4. So uh, the canonical name of nematicity is usually related to a breaking C4 symmetry. So whether it's nematic or not uh, depends on your definition. Yeah. Uh, but another comment was that uh, in relation to this B1, G, B2, G, there is this uh, system you may know, uh, it's just a comment, 1, 1, 4, 4, which indeed breaks the symmetry uh, 45 degrees of the one that happens in 1, 2, 2. So, and that, that indeed happens and it's, uh, uh, it's a system, there's a family of these materials uh, you may want to look at. Sorry, have, what, we, what, what, what indeed happens in the 1144? The, the, the symmetry, the symmetry that is broken there is B to G symmetry. Uh -huh. But so, I thought, uh, yeah, so I, I have not uh, looked at 1144. As yeah, that's, as that's, that's uh, exactly the example. So that's why yeah, I'm making but this But I, I thought structurally, uh, there's some... Initially, it's tetragonal, right? But what what's get broken is uh, example is calcium, calcium, potassium, mm -hmm. uh, iron, four, arsenide, four. I, I will. Uh, I'll, send, I'll, I'll, send, I'll send you a link to. Yeah, our please. Paper. But, uh, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, thank you for the comment, and uh, I, I I'm very interested in looking at the one one four four innovation follow up. I said I'm very interested in following up. But in, regarding the first part, um, uh, so. Uh, the perspective I take is that, well, uh, C4 is also part of a crystalline uh, mm -hmm. symmetry, right? Sure. And so, so long as it breaks a, a discrete symmetry uh, in this uh, cat categorization, and if I have a classification scheme that encompasses B1, G, B2, G that normally one thinks about, uh, I think A2, G qualifies as, as a, a pneumatic order state, but at the end of it, it's a semantics. It's a, it's an irreducible representation. Yeah, it depends on what the canonical, mm -hmm. it, yeah, uh, name to that is. I mean, initially, as Matthew pointed out, uh, is a broken C4 symmetry. And, yeah. and both B1 and B2 break C4, A2, uh, well, B1 and B2 also break mirrors, as you correctly say. Uh, but uh, uh, A2 breaks more mirrors and preserves C4. Right, yeah. and then, and yeah, you can build a density wave. So the proposal to, for uranium, uranium, ruthenium to silicon two was, was yeah, one uh, uh, you know, uh, exactly where it breaks, breaks locally A to G, but it's a staggered order, etc. But well, of all people, I do not need to uh, to point out to you that the A to G is very interesting. Oh, sure. uh, and uh, all that I'm saying that if you find uh, a tetragonal phase, uh, it, it may still have a broken, a discrete symmetry, and uh, uh, but I, oh yeah, A two really... definitely A two breaks discrete symmetry. There's no yeah, yeah uh, there's no question about that. It so lowers it, it very... lowers the point group symmetry. It you go from D four H to C C two V or whatever uh, C four V. It would be very interesting. We certainly have not thought enough about it. It would be very interesting to see what the um, uh, uh, what are the signatures of the a to G. Uh, well, we discussed the, that in uh, in relation to this uranium yeah, no, no, I, silicon. I, 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 so actually, can, I meant uh, to, uh, yeah, I'll be happy to I, I discuss meant, that. I meant to mention the connection with the uh, uranium uranium to silicon to a fascinating uh, system and uh, 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 absolutely. Uh, so it would, it would be very interesting uh, to consider. So yeah, I imagine Raman, for instance, would be very much equipped to analyze uh, the the consequence, the, the signatures of it. Thank you. Okay, I think we've come to the end of all the questions and it's a good chance for us to thank Chi Miao for a great and very stimulating talk. Uh, so unmute your microphones and... Uh... Oh, 
May yeah. I say, say yes. something? Yes, go ahead. Okay, so I think this this was really wonderful uh, new type of conference, and I really enjoyed the many talks I, I listened to. And so I wish to thank all the organizers, in particular you, Piers, for putting this all together and uh, keeping track of uh, of the of the whole uh, program. Thank you very much. Well, actually, it's everyone who was involved in the organizing committee did a huge amount of work, and it would be impossible without a collective effort. So we'll take that as a collective thanks to all of us. Thank you. Um, uh, so, well, so first of all, um, uh, let me applaud all the participants. Uh, and uh, some of you have stayed up really late at night. Some of you have gotten up incredibly early in the morning. Um, this has been a, a, a great experience and also the students who really asked lots of questions, plucked up their courage and asked questions uh, uh, to the speakers. It's been a very good experience. Um, Gunnar has, uh, I've just sent you all a copy of the uh, assessment of who actually participated in the meeting. Gunnar has taken this from the registrations. It's not a, it's not a final count, but I'll share the screen with you just to have a look at that. Um, uh, this is the, is it the right one? I think that's the right one. Did I get it right? I think so. Let me share that with you. Yeah, so here is the, uh, here is the um, uh, histogram of the participants. We've had something like 36 countries participate um, we haven't been able to completely uh, separate out all the numbers. So you can see there's the third country on the list here is the country of Gmail. Um, uh, so uh, it'd be interesting to know how that divides subsequently, but we've got countries all the way from Indonesia, Ukraine, uh, Russia. Uh, the count there on China is actually an undercount. We had about 10 from China, uh, Taiwan, Argentina, uh, Lots of participants from Europe and Japan, um, Brazil, South America. This has been a, a great experience. And I think one of the questions that we will all have to ask is whether in our future face-to-face -face conferences, we'll also be having an online component. I think it's an interesting point to uh, think about for the future. Um, but we're basically done with our meeting. Um, uh, and what we thought we would do, anyone wants to hang around, we'd hang around uh, chatting for uh, uh, 20 more minutes just to say hi to each other. Anyone's welcome to join that. Um, if you have any suggestions uh, uh, that you want to send to us by email, please do. Um, the website's still going to be up. We're going to update all the PDFs and all of the videos. Um, you may find it interesting to know that uh, some of the videos have been watched up to uh, 500 times. Um, so there's certainly been a lot of interest generated there. Um, so thank you, everyone. And that brings us to an end uh, of Condensed Matter in the Cities. And we're just going to go now and uh, chill out at the notionally at the pub on the corner. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you. Okay, we will get a beer from the fridge. Go get your beer so that we can yeah. just have one person. <laughs> I have a statistic. I have some tap water. I hope that. The other country that was very much underrepresented okay. in the statistics that we sent around is India. So very many people from India subscribe to Gmail just so I think that probably would be good. Maybe we can uh, filter that I'd out. Like now. Yeah, we, I think we should, uh, had, we should have had a country uh, query in the registration. Yes, that would have made this would have made it a lot easier, wouldn't it? <laughs> I think um, I think uh, people who are in different time zones will have been much more likely to look at the talks offline yes. rather than turn up. Mm -hmm. There were certainly some people from Australia that told me. We're going to watch every talk, but we won't be on the Zoom call. Yeah. So those didn't need to register, right? They, well, they sort of did because we didn't. I mean, okay, at least for the live thing. No, I guess anybody can look at YouTube, of course. Yeah. Right. Probably, if I, 
if I may, I want to I want to say two things. Uh, one is that I think uh, it's amazing the amount of work all the organizers have put in, and the cheerfulness that everybody is uh, part of it. To me, really reflects um, this consortium. Uh, what do you call it, uh, Hubbard? The Hubbard Theory Consortium, we call it. Hubbard Theory Consortium. You, you should be very proud that this consortium is working so well. Uh, I think with all that, uh, this cannot uh, have happened. Uh, the second thing is that I wonder whether, you know, you could uh, summarize. It. It's not uh, a point of making you to do more work, but just the, some of the obvious things you've uh, learned from the organization. Could you put it out in some form publicly just because? I think we will. And I think one of the things we want to particularly do is to um, uh, share some of the things we actually did in terms of making it work. Uh, Gunnar yeah. and Sam did a huge amount of work behind the scenes, both on the WordPress website, yeah. but also uh, the little, all the little buttons you have to twink to make sure that Zoom streams to live video and how you have to connect up to YouTube. Um, there's a lot of detail there that would be really good to record. But also, I mean, you really captured the students uh, until the very end, and that is not easy. That, that is, uh, I'm sure there's a effort behind the scene to make that happen. Uh, <laughs> well, I think they want to get attendance points so they can come to the face-to-face -face school next year. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fine. I got some German beer and I want to drink to all the organizers for one. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. 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 Yeah, I mean, I think it's good to give the students a role. I mean, I think they appreciated leading some discussions and yeah, yeah I think. Video submissions have generated a very good response. So that was That's a great idea. So they, they feel they are part of uh, the whole thing. Yeah. Hey, there's Victor, my, one of my students. Yeah, yeah it was the, the, the student sessions were act, like the best we could do, I think, for the online version. <laughs> uh, you know, it, it's better. It's usually better always to be in a, in a seminar room and, like Pierce said, to, you know, have the blackboard and be more interactive. More, but this this worked well for uh, the circumstances. So I think thank you for like making sure you organized it for the students. It was nice. Yeah, I wonder whether we could do with a, some bloggers. Um, one of the things we haven't really kept a good record of is all the questions. Yeah, uh, and it would be good to have them in print on a page somewhere, and the kinds of responses and the references that go with them. Uh, that would that would be useful. Um, uh, yeah, in past, past, past conference I had, we had that. Yeah. Well, there's chats get saved, right? I mean, in the recording. Yeah, that's, the saved. that's true. I, I mean, I suppose we could put the chats up if we wanted to. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the ones that happened during the talks, I mean, everything in the chat got pretty much read out anyway at some point. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. But the videos do have a record of this. What we don't have a record of is the student sessions afterwards, but yeah, I mean, maybe that's partially for the better because it allows you to be a bit less, less um, exposed. Limited. Yes. When you are in our local graduate uh, journal club, the staff are not allowed, are not allowed to be near the room or the Zoom room when they are doing it. And, and I, I have tentatively sometimes asked, how about for this one, maybe we could turn up? And it's been very clear, they don't want this to happen. <laughs> there must be some magic that breaks. <laughs> yeah, you can't let your hair down so easily if you've got your boss in the room. Um, um, one one yeah. thing I should let you all know is that uh, I'm, I'm not escaping from the online world. In one month's time, ICAM is running uh, uh, it, its annual meeting, we're calling it an ICAM summit. Um, and we're going to use some of the experiences from this meeting at that meeting. Yeah. One of the things we're doing is that for weird reasons, no, uh, Phil Anderson didn't have a funeral, didn't have a memorial, nothing this year. So we're going to hold a little event uh, at the ICAM summit, which will open to everyone. Um, we're going to have Andy Zangwell 
uh, give us a talk on Phil Anderson. Andy Zangwell was Phil's biographer. And so he's written a book on Andy that will come out next year. And then we're gonna have an, a, a round table with people who knew Phil very well, like Bill Brinkman uh, and Duncan Haldane chatting uh, around a table. And we're gonna to try to have this kind of intimacy that we have here. Um, and so I've actually invited Gunnar and Sam if they would like to help out a little bit with that so we can make this a success. Um, uh, so um, that, that surely will resonate with the community. It just it will, so. I think we'll probably have to split it up into maybe those who watch on YouTube and those who get invited because the numbers may actually blow up on us. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, for that kind of event. Um, uh, what, what's the maximum number of uh, well, uh, of uh, participants who have joined your Zoom thing. We, 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 got, we did get to 550 and then it blew up on us. Yeah, yeah, no, I was there and, the first day. That may not have been because of the numbers. It may be because I did something stupid that day. Uh, that's my suspicion. Um, no, I, I have a feeling that day there really was actually a central problem with Zoom. Yeah, I see. Yes, it we don't know. It was nothing we did. I see. We were just unfortunate it was the first day. Yeah, so anyway, um, although I did start the meeting on my cell phone and then I swiped up my cell phone account and then logged in. And I have the feeling that that left that account still there and it logged us all off at some point, but I don't actually know. Um, no, so, so you need a, that was yes, you need a second data point. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We have another 500 people together to see if it breaks down again. Yeah, yeah but. I mean, throughout the first week, we had two to three hundred, I think, at most of the events on Zoom. We did. That's Second week we did. was between one and two hundred. Yeah, yeah. So it, it stayed pretty um, big throughout. Yeah. And no, there was another right. 20 to 50 watching on YouTube, it seems, for yeah. most talks. Yeah. So, so the count says the UK participation is 170? 193, according to 193. this. 193. Yeah. That's a and, lot. And 163 from the USA, which is quite good given the time zone, although mm -hmm. that's partly because I insisted we hold it in the afternoon so that we could get up for it. Um, well, my, my students, uh, they want to join in. They were too shy to ask for registration because it's closed. So did they say, oh, we're just, there's a live stream. Yeah. yeah. Streaming. Yeah. So yeah, we probably had a lot on live streaming. So good. Yeah. No, so it'll be. Um, it's, I mean, normally this meeting has about 25 to 30 people in the seminar room. Um, so this is an explosion. <laughs> you, you <laughs> brought oh, nobody your... else bets. <laughs> no, I, I, think, 30 uh, limit, I think. Uh, for we, event like we this, 60 or so at points. Yeah, okay, yes. Uh, for a format like this, the larger number of organizers really, really is helpful because there's yeah, so you much need there. many hands on deck to keep yeah. it going. I think yeah. so. Yeah. Um, and, and the point is that staff cannot help you. <laughs> yeah. Strangely, that's... I think it felt more intimate as well. Because a, a, a hundred people in a seminar room, some of the students might, may have been shut, um, more reserved about asking questions and so on. But I think with this format, the barrier is lower. And I, I yeah, think that's a probably. good thing. Actually. Yeah. And yeah. I think also particularly because they could type them into the chat to begin with, and then they see that nobody thinks they're stupid questions. And yes. they get the confidence. Yes. Right. I must also say it has helped that everyone who has participated has been very civil. Because in a group of 200 people, you know, you just need 1% of trolls, and you already have two trolls. And this hasn't happened. You know, yeah. you see all kinds of discussions on YouTube, on live streams, where people start to be a bit impolite about how silly. And none of that has happened. I'm very proud of our community, I think. Yeah, no, there's been very, very good behavior in the whole thing. We didn't yeah. have to throw anyone out. Um, uh, we were worried about that when we first did this. We thought we, what was going to happen. <laughs> but no, but it, they were practice very... throwing me out, Piers, I seem to recall. Okay, you may... Whether I'd be able to attend at all. <laughs> right, we practiced throwing Andrew out at the beginning. <laughs> um, that's good. One of the suggestions from John Saunders is that maybe the HTC should think about whether it can apply for a joint grant to the EPSRC. 
Um, and I, I think that's something we might want to think about. Actually, yeah. I mean, you mean just for the conference or to actually? Well, no, I think kind the, of program way, grant. the best way is to go for a program grant, probably. So that's something we might want to think about moving towards in the next year. Um, good idea. Is my perception that the overall group has grown. Uh, is that correct in recent years? Sort of, you know, no, we've, we've, we've lo also lost, we, we lost Matthias Eschrig. That's true. I think compared to the very beginning, it has grown because when we started, yeah. you know, UCL was not part of the HTC and uh, the Kent side has grown. So I think in total, probably it's grown, right? Yeah, that's true. We have Imperial. And I, I think the fact that the HTC existed has helped that because managers see something that has an entity that is worth investing in. Yeah, certainly you guys at Kent have grown tremendously over this period. Yeah. You moved there and you've grown your group. That's, and, uh, so that's been a tremendous... Uh, uh, Even, uh, you know, Sam, Sam was not uh, in Kent when we started. Yes. So first Sam came, then Gunnar. Yes. So, yeah, it's... Yeah. Um, Piers, Yes. Are we wanting to continue streaming this to YouTube? <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. 